Take a break, Adamu. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science. Nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Everest Plateau. Give me a little volume there on the headphones, buddy. More. Turn right. it up. Yeah, yeah, there, there we go. go. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. Thank you. And uh, so we got an interesting show for you guys this week. We've been talking about this and um, this idea of uh, the rabbit hole, rabbit hole. So the last time we did this was, what, was it in the 70s? Did we look this up? Yeah, we looked it up. I can't remember when it was. It was a while back. Yeah, so... We, th- we were thinking that maybe this is something we should do every hundred, hundred episodes or so, yeah. uh, basically to kind of update where we are in general, and also to give people who listen to the show a place, possibly, for new listeners to start, because it kind of will give a kind of an overview of what's going on in our heads. Yeah. Um, so totally yeah, that's, unprepared. Yeah. Just, uh... Yeah, it's got to be on the fly. Yeah, on the fly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how we do it here at uh, Brothers of the Servant. And, uh, okay, so agriculturally speaking, we're getting really close to harvest. Uh, we're finished bottling. Well, we had For to. Now. Yeah, we had to. Um, we had some extra because we didn't have enough bottles. So we've got three barrels uh, that we didn't get to bottle. We thought there were going to be two, but there ended up being three. Right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. I. Um, didn't count yeah properly math math is hard but we we had one pallet of bottles that was on it was like there was an inventory a snafu and uh we didn't get the amount that we ordered which we would right. have had enough to bottle it all yeah yeah so we're just it's gonna age longer in the barrel which is good for it I right mean, it's gonna be better wine yeah really. so we'll just be releasing that later yep and uh, the bricks, which is uh, percent sugar measurement in the grapes, is at 20 on the um, cab and also 20 on the money. 20.2 on the on the cab. And our goal is 24, 26-ish. Yeah, between there. I mean, I it'd be nice if the cab was even at 27, but... That's not going to happen. Probably not. <laughs> pH is going to skyrocket. Before. Right, yeah. Because it, it, it's at this point... We just it's want a, them to be ripe. Because the, the cab has a really strong herbal smell when it's not quite ripe. When it's still a little bit green, like if the seeds have any green in them, uh, you get this bell pepper sort of yeah. cut grass, yeah. um, asparagus, this green smell. Yeah. And uh, So you wait a little longer and the seeds kind of brown a little bit and yeah, you get less of that. You get but, less of that. And it's called, the, the chemical compound is called methoxypyrazines. Ah. Uh. And that's what gives it that green smell. Yeah. So we're wanting less of those. Right. So it's a juggling act because you have you have the sugar content, and then you have the pH, and then you have the, the actual ripeness. And you're watching the pH rise along with the sugar, and you're trying to target a certain amount of sugar without the pH being too ridiculously high. Uh, sort yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. And your sugar is all about, you know, the alcohol content, right, really. Yeah. But and so uh, what they say in the industry is you want your cab to be big and bold. And so you want it to have a higher alcohol, uh, changes the mouthfeel of the wine. Yeah. But, I mean, I've had plenty of great wines that were 12, 13 percent. Yeah. But I guess. What was the percentage of the stuff we just bottled, you know? Um, I think it was 13.5. Yeah. Okay. 13.5. Yeah, I got the numbers somewhere, but um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, people were asking me like, "What's the alcohol?" I'm like, eh, "Yeah, it's thirteen point probably thirteen ish like around there, thirteen fourteen, yeah. yeah." Okay, and it's a high pH wine. I mean, one of them is like four point one, yeah, which is high for That's wine. High. Yeah, it's like I guess ideally you want three point six or three point eight, yeah, um, for a red and even lower for whites, but um, it does contribute to the flavor profile and the mouthfeel of the wine, the higher pHs, and it can be smoother. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you risk, it, it's just risky because the higher the pH, the more opportunity for bio- uh, for microbial spoilage. Yeah. In the right. wine. 
So as long as it doesn't spoil, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> right. But, you know, they say you want a wine to last 10 years on a shelf, and with a, a wine with a pH that high, probably not. Probably, gonna probably not going to last yeah. that long. right. So drink it when you get it. That's right. <laughs> and we can't ship out of state, so I know a lot of people have been asking about that, um, but we're working on it. Yeah. And even in, even the stuff we're working on is still in country, right? I don't know oh, if yeah. they do yeah. international shipping. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. I uh, don't know much about it. It's not my department. Right. Yeah. It's not, not, our, not our job. Uh, okay, what about the band? $50 Dynasty, what are you guys doing? You're uh... Uh, still working on mixes and exporting. So these project files that I have in Logic Pro uh, 10, I think is what I have, it, they're massive and I've got um, all kinds of effects and things that, you know, in some mostly on the vocals, but a few on guitars and stuff, not too much stuff on the drums, but things that I've applied within that DAW, the DAW digital audio workstation. And so if I, I have to go through every song and decide, do I want to send this, do I want to print this effect into the file Yeah, and send that track, like if it's a vocal track, with that effect embedded? Or do I want to give the mix engineer the option to... Use his own effect. To do his own thing. Yeah. And so that's kind of a tough decision sometimes. And so, and then there's different ways of exporting if you want to do that. Sometimes it makes it a stereo file, which makes the file two channels instead of one. Yeah. If you've got a stereo effect. So, you know, the last one we did ended up being 60 tracks hmm. at plus. There's maybe even more because I ended up separating a bunch of vocals that were grouped. Hmm. I like had choir effects and just put four yeah. vocals together. Right. And, then, you know, I ended up separating them out. So it's just... I've been working on that for another song, and uh, I I got every track prepared. You know, you don't want anything that like clips right when it's coming in. You want nice fade ins and stuff, so there's yeah. no there's no little artifacts that'll pop out in a mix. Mm. So you just got to go in and clean up stuff, and you got to make a lot of decisions. And then, so I never actually exported any of the tracks. I just worked on the song oh, for okay. almost twelve hours. Oh shit! Yesterday, yeah. And it's probably going to be that way for most songs most and sometimes more. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, and there was a little bit of stuff like, ah, you know, this, this is not the right sound. Like uh, this one little vocal part or something. And then I jumped in there and just like at, recorded another mm. little piece. And then, then I figured out that uh, we actually made a mistake and... I was playing a major seven and Ty's guitars weren't playing a major seven <laughs> at this one part. And I'm like, oh my God, this sounds terrible together. <laughs> but you couldn't hear it in the whole mix, but I'm like, no, this is bad. Yeah. So I'm going to re-record the acoustic on the choruses. Oh. Which that's, you know, doesn't take long, but it's another thing. Yeah, the old wrong chord trick. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> you guys didn't study the material before you went into the studio to record your parts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that happens. I Professionals, mean. ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> still playing the wrong chords. <laughs> it made it look like I was playing the wrong right, chord, but no, yeah. I wrote the song, yeah. so <laughs> I know I was playing the right chord. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and do uh, Space Weather News. Now that we got our uh, agricultural and rock and roll update, we've got Space Weather Update. From spaceweather.com, almost spotless solar flare. Earlier today, on August 9th, the spotless sun produced a C1-class solar flare. Upon closer inspection, the sun might not be spotless after all, and a new sunspot is emerging from that blast site. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's interesting because their list here says sunspot number is 11, so I guess they decided after writing this that, yeah, the sun actually has 11 spots, not zero. <laughs> hmm. uh, rare naked eye nova. Every 20 years or so, a thermonuclear explosion occurs on the surface of RS Ophph, or Off, O-P-H, a white dwarf in the constellation Ophiuchus. Uh -huh. Yesterday, it happened again. On August 8th, the brightness of this tiny star increased 600-fold from magnitude 12 to 5. Keith Geary of Ireland was the first to notice. Hours later, Italian astronomer Ernesto Guido... <laughs> and colleagues photographed the outburst using a remote-controlled telescope in Australia. This is called a recurrent nova, and it is very rare. In the whole Milky Way galaxy, only seven star systems are known to produce such 
explosions. So this wow, is, that's really cool. Hey, and that was on the Cosmographia birthday. Yeah, and so this ties in a bit. I'll, I'll well, we'll talk about it. Let me finish the article here. So RS Of is a binary star, or Of uh, is a very lopsided one. On one side is a white dwarf, and the other side is a red giant. There's very little distance between the two, so the gravity of the white dwarf is able to pull gaseous material off of the larger star and down onto itself. And every couple yeah. of decades, enough matter accumulates to trigger an explosion. The last time this happened was in 2006. At fifth magnitude, the current outburst is visible to the unaided eye, just barely. Binoculars or a telescope will allow you to see it with ease. Look south after sunset. Ophiuchus hangs high in the sky just above the better known constellations Scorpius and Sagittarius. So yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody when we talked about this, um, the uh, type 1A supernova. Yeah, stellar nucleosynthesis episode. Yeah, well, in the Type 1A supernova, specifically about measuring distances using magnitude, right. it was about white dwarves pulling material pulling, in, and then yeah. they, incur- they, they, there's uh, a threshold. They, they go reach. past the Chandrasekhar limit, yeah. and then they, the the star completely unbinds itself and becomes a supernova. That's not what is happening here. Oh, this is a recurrent nova. So this star is not passing that, that limit threshold. Okay. So I wonder, and they're saying that this does this. This is a rare thing, but. Uh, there are seven star systems that do this. In other words, recurrent novas, right? Um, so I know that those of you who are interested in, for example, electric universe or plasma universe and micronovas with our sun will be interested in this data. So if you want more information on it, go to uh, spaceweather.com for uh, August 9th, and you can see the article there, and they've got a bunch of links about this process. Um and the other systems that produce it. Uh, because, you know, in the plasma slash electric universe model, uh, and some other people have theorized about this. I know um, Mario Build Reps talks about micronovas and the possibility that our sun may every once in a while have a... It, it's So it's, it's hard for me to imagine a star exploding just a little bit, right? <laughs> that's that's it, it because because a nova is pretty much the entire star shoving a bunch of material off of it. It's, it's shedding material due to like some kind of collapse of its core, right? But this particular kind of recurrent nova is very specific and it is it takes a white dwarf to do it. So the white dwarf is already a collapsed star. It's already gone through its long life cycle process of being like our sun, right? And then it runs out of fuel and then its core collapses and it novas and blows off most of its outer material. And then you end up with this incredibly tiny, incredibly dense, we talked about this electron gas mm-hmm. material, right? It's not quite, it doesn't, it doesn't have enough mass to become a neutron star, which is where the, gra- this, the gravity is so high that it shoves the electrons into the protons and they cancel each other out and become neutrons. And then it's just a ton of neutrons sitting there next to each other. Instead, this is electron, this is called electron degenerate gas. So it's, it's uh, all the electrons are completely filling up all of their possible quantum phase states. That's that's how it's phrased. I don't even know what that means. But the point is, is that it's incredibly dense material. It's no longer on fire like a normal star is, but it's glowing because it's got recur- it's got residual heat. And mm-hmm. they take. I mean, you, there's all kinds of theories on how long do they take to cool down, you know, but a white dwarf is probably going to remain that way for billions of years it's going to be really hot and there's a concept an interesting concept in in astronomy of the idea of a black dwarf which would be a white dwarf that has been cooled down it's it's not next to another star drawing material from it so it's been able to sit out there in space and and just by radiation cool itself down but so then no does it no longer uh, exist as a gas does it change its phase state no it just is you can't see it anymore because uh, it's this it's like small it's like the size of earth or maybe our moon and yet it's it's the same temperature as like the background of space so it's mm. almost at absolute zero it's like you know 2 kelvin or something like that whatever the microwave background is because that's mm. the only thing heating it up at that point yeah, yeah. so it's completely black and tiny and incredibly dense so it, it, it's very dangerous if you're, you know, if you're just kind of flying around in space and you get close to it, you won't ever see it and it'll just suck your spaceship in and you're, <laughs> you're done. It's game over. Well, it might be a little bit hotter than, than the background because <laughs> it, it would be pulling in little objects. Right. If it was there. passing through. Yeah, that's right. You're right. It would have a, 
you would have you'd have, it, have to it, have a really sensitive instrument to be right, able to detect yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Or you would just have to see it based on it affecting other things around it by gravity. Same way, you know, with a black hole. Like a, it may have an accretion disk or something. Yeah. But the point is, is that according to the standard model right now, there are no black dwarves because there hasn't been enough time in the lifetime of the universe for them to cool down. Man, I bet you could make some good pancakes on one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice and flat. Not a cold one, though. <laughs> I won't cook it. <laughs> yeah. Pan I don't spears. like them when they swell up real thick. You know, yeah, you got to mash them down. I got a good flat pancake. <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> so anyway, this is a white dwarf that is not going through the process of unbinding. So I wonder what the difference is, because this is implying that the reason this is happening is because it's very, very close to its to its binary companion. Mm. So I wonder if it's uh, it approaches the Chandrasekhar limit too quickly, and it the explosion takes place, and it's th thermonuclear. Bef like in other words, it it doesn't because the other the other Type One A supernova, the material is being leached onto the star. And it is taking place slowly enough to where that material is spread out and converted into the degenerate material that the rest of the star is. And then once that star reaches a certain mass limit of all that degenerate material, then it, begin, it undergoes a catastrophic fusion process in a, in a state in which it can't, the, 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 um, the particles can't move because they're in this quantum phase state that's locked. So the whole thing explodes. It mm. completely, and, and the, the thermonuclear reaction takes place very quickly, the entire star does it all at once, right? In this case, because it's so close to its binary companion, the material is being leached onto it so quickly that it doesn't have time to all turn into that degenerate gas before it actually undergoes fusion again and explodes mm. just the outside layer. So it's yeah. a recurrent nova without destroying the source. That's pretty It's cool. really interesting. Yeah, and a rare, and a rare thing, so... It's kind of counterintuitive to me. I would have thought it would be the other way around. But after I thought about it, I was like, okay, I guess what's happening is the material that the star is leaching onto it, it's pouring onto there so quickly that it doesn't have time to turn into the degenerate material. So it's basically got this thick layer of regular mass on the outside of the star. And once it builds up enough of that, there's it, that stuff just explodes. But mm -hmm. the interior part of the star doesn't take, pl doesn't take part in that nova. Hmm. God. Yeah. So many details. Yep. All right. Uh, so Try to understand. <laughs> current conditions. Solar wind speed is 350.4 kilometers per second. The density is 12 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is 11. Uh, the neutron count today is 8.3% above the space age average. And they do have a, um, I just wanted to add, they have a, they have a graph here showing this data. And it looks to me like the most recent low was in 2016. And it was at like almost negative 5%. Like we've never seen a reading that low as when we've been reading this on the podcast. They've always been above, at least above 7% above, right? Mm -hmm. But this reading in 2016 is, um, it's below zero and it almost reaches negative 5. But it says on here that the minimum of all the data they've ever measured was 32.1% below the space age average. Mm. And that was measured in 1991. Hmm. Whereas the high was in 2009 and that was 11.7% above the average. So there's that. And then the right. KP index right now is zero and the 24 hour max is two, both rated as quiet. All right. And a crypto update. Bitcoin is at $45,640. Hey. And Ethereum, $3,109. All right. So, yeah, looking pretty good on the old crypto front. <laughs> yep. And uh, I got a series of stories here, all connected. Okay. Or maybe no, nah, they're not connected. <laughs> okay. Totally unconnected. Totally stories. unconnected stories from space.com. <laughs> Uh, and these are a couple weeks old. Flashing meteor that exploded over Norway landed somewhere in a nearby forest. The meteor shook the air and created a sonic boom as it passed overhead. The hunt for fragments of an unusually large meteor that lit up the skies over Norway on the 25th of July has begun. The meteor awakened awestruck residents of the country's capital city, also 
That's the name of the capital city. Uh, with the sound of a large explosion. Footage shows the fireball from the meteor streaking across the sky in a trail of bright flashes at around 1 a.m. local time Sunday morning before it landed somewhere in a forest near Olso. Is that the one that was green where they got the picture of it? It's a line with green. I don't know. Okay, because there was one and people were like, I recognize a Death Star test fire when I see one. (laughs) (laughs) That's probably one of these. Um uh, the rumbling of the meteor startled numerous residents and led to calls to Norwegian emergency services. Though no injuries or damage have been reported yet, the Norwegian police uh, said. The Norwegian Meteor Network, NMN, a group that monitors meteor activity in the country, has analyzed video footage of the extraplanetary visitor's trajectory to pinpoint its landing site, which the group believes to be somewhere in the Finnemarka Forest, located 40 miles from Olso. So there's that. Oh, the meteor the meteor was traveling up to 43,200 miles per hour hey. or 72,000 kilometers per hour. What? <laughs> I know this sent me on an immediate rabbit hole. I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. So I looked this up and no, those two numbers do not correlate okay. in the same way. So I don't know why the whatever the rounding whoever Whoever figured the miles rounded it off, and then whoever figured the kilometers rounded it off, and they did it in different oh, ways because they are not the same. I can't remember which is wh- like. So the question is: Is are the people looking for the meteor out in the forest yes. going to come back still human? <laughs> the question is: Whoever wrote this story probably just maybe did some extra rounding. Yeah, I know. But I mean, come on. 43,200 miles per hour or 72,000 kilometers per hour. I'm just hour. predicting they're going to come back out of the forest and be like, we found the meteor. We are fine. <laughs> uh, Billet, not sure who he is, probably mentioned earlier in the story, told Reuters news agency that the meteor was deflected to Earth when it hit our solar system's asteroid belt while traveling between Mars and Jupiter. But further details about the otherworldly arrival remain elusive. With an object of this size, it's nearly impossible to get an overview of absolutely everything, Billet said. It would have been easier had it had a steeper course. We don't know yet whether it was a rock or an iron meteorite. From experience, it's more likely to be a rock, but we can't draw conclusions yet. Yeah. Stone or rock meteorites tend to have formed on the surface or crust of a planet or a large asteroid, whereas iron ones come from the planet or asteroid's core. The MNN... M- NMN conducted a search for fragments from the meteor Sunday morning and into the afternoon. The group su- suspects that given the tough-to-find location somewhere in the middle of a forest, any meteorite fragments could take up to 10 years to discover. Wow. Okay. Carbonaceous chondrite, I think is what they call the stony ones. Next story from space.com. Fireball streaks across North Texas, creating light show and sonic boom. Hundreds of people witnessed the flash. A fireball streaked across North Texas last night, leading to several hundred witness reports of a bright flash and sonic boom. The celestial drama occurred around 9 p.m. local time on Sunday, Hmm. July 25th, according to CBS Dallas-Fort Worth. The nonprofit American Meteor Society, AMS, has since recorded 213 reports of the fireball, including three videos. The witnesses were mostly in northern Texas, but some reports seeing the fireball above Oklahoma, Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Videos of that fireball show a large object streaking across the sky for a few seconds. Most people who reported seeing the fireball estimated that it lasted between three and four seconds. About 14 people who saw the object said it made a sound as it streaked through the sky. And so they go on to describe what a meteor is again. Um... Blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Any other details about the meteor? Um, Let's see what they say here. Thousands of small meteorites hit Earth each year, though most fall unnoticed into the ocean or into unpopulated regions. Many thousands more bits of rock and space dust burn up completely in the atmosphere, visible only as meteors. The next best opportunity to see meteors is in August, when Earth will pass through the lingering debris left by Swift-Tuttle Comet creating the annual meteor shower known as the Perseids. We didn't set up a party to to watch that. No, we didn't. These meteors are too tiny and fragile to reach Earth, but they create a light show of up to 100 shooting stars per hour. Okay. It's been real hazy. 
Yeah. I mean, I have gone out and looked up and the last other, night it was actually pretty nice. The other night I was when I was down here, uh I was outside and I was looking up and it was like the clearest night we've had in a long time. I was able to see the, the full Milky Way and yeah. the moon was not up and uh but yeah, it's been hazy and muggy and you know, which is kind <clears> of <throat> Yeah, we had another influx of uh African dust. Yeah. And maybe smoke from the fires, I don't know. Okay. Final story. This is from live livescience.com. An asteroid about as long as the Great Pyramid of Giza is tall made a close approach with Earth on Sunday, July 25th, <laughs> according to NASA calculations. There is no worry that the space rock poses any threat to Earth, but NASA monitors such rocks to both learn more about the early solar system. Asteroids are rocky fragments from that time, and because uh, if their orbits were to change, the asteroid could pose a future risk to Earth. On its closest approach, the near-Earth asteroid, called 2008 GO20, swung within 2.8 million miles of our blue marble, about eight times further away than the moon. It will be trekking at a whopping 18,000 miles per hour, according to new reports. That's 29,000 kilometers per hour for those of you across the pond. The rock is estimated to be anywhere from 318 to 720 feet across, uh, or 97 to 220 meters. The Great Pyramid of Giza stands at 450 feet, or 138 meters tall. Any space rock larger than at about 490 feet, or 150 meters across, that is expected to make a shave with Earth within 4.6 million miles is considered a potentially hazardous asteroid. For comparison, that distance is 19.5 times the span between Earth and the Moon. And in reality, that distance doesn't hold a candle to the closest known flyby an uh, of an asteroid, uh, at least one that didn't smash into us, which occurred on August 16th of 2020, when 2020 QG zipped just 1,830 miles above the Indian Ocean. Live science sister site Space.com reported, uh, such, a little, such little space rocks pose no danger to life on Earth. On the other hand, 2,000... Or, 2008G020 is a potentially hazardous because over time the gravitational tug of the planets could change the object's orbital path so that it crosses Earth's orbit. Yeah. If that were to happen, a future collision with our planet is possible, NASA said. This isn't the first time 2008G020 has visited Earth's quarters. It made its closest approach on August 4th, 1901, when the asteroid swung to 806 uh, well, roughly 807,000 miles of our planet, according to NASA records. Its next closest flyby happened on July 31st of 1935 at a distance of 1.15 million miles. And then when it next flies by Earth on July 24th, 2034, it will get as close as 3.1 million miles. Mm. But isn't that interesting? Yeah. It flies, it, it makes its closest approach on Sunday, the 25th, yeah. the same day that two different... Large you know, bolides come into the atmosphere. One yeah. of them landed. Yeah. Hmm. I'm just like, yeah. Is it dragon? Yeah. Debris? It's surely, it's got. Yeah. And they're like, we wonder where these came from. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe. maybe I'm way off, but it just yeah. That, that is seems too coincidental. Yeah. It's got it's got a it's got a train. Yeah. A gaggle. Right. It's it's part of a cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, just want to go take a break and get into the. Yeah. What are we doing? Oh, I, mean, I got oh, emails. Oh yeah. Well, let's just do. Let's do some. Let's do some emails. <clears throat> All right. This is from uh, uh, Kevin, and it's called Mammoth Springs down the road from Duck Creek. It says, hey, bros. I would like to tell you about my experiences around Mammoth Springs, Utah. From spring 2008 to spring th 2009, I took a year off from work camping. I reached the burnout limit working six, uh, six to seven, 10 or 12 hour days in my trade for 19 years. And I finally said, fuck it, I'm taking some time off. I am not married and my friends had jobs, so most of the time I was alone. I camped all over from south of 70 down into Arizona and all over Nevada and up the California coast from Redding up through Oregon and Washington. It was an awesome time. 
I had three really weird experiences around the Mammoth Springs area, and I would like to share them with you guys. First one, I'm camping. Middle of the night, I wake up and something wasn't right. I closed my eyes to go back to sleep and something came over me. I don't know if I couldn't move or I wouldn't move, but I was frozen. I saw a whitish light through my eyelids. It was like on Aliens 2 in the beginning shuttle scanning scene. The light sta uh, started at my head and then to my feet and then back up again at least twice. So it was like scanning him. Wow. I always have my Glock 21 right next to me. <laughs> I didn't grab it. I don't know if I couldn't grab it or I knew inside I didn't need to. Okay, second experience at Mammoth. I was on my second or third day there camping. There are like five to six dispersed sites there. The weekend was over and I found myself all alone. I cooked breakfast that morning, ate, cleaned dishes, then finally started enjoying the outdoors. It wasn't 20 minutes later that I got the worst feeling I have ever had in the mountains in my life. Something was there, and it didn't want me there. I packed up and got the F out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Look, I have camped all over the lower 48 and a little up in Alaska. That is the only time over the years that I have had that feeling. Uh, and my third strange experience there, maybe a month before my first weird experience, something strange happened. It was just weird. I found out what I saw was a thing about a month ago when I heard some podcast bring it up. I had my truck fixed up by then, and I had a bed platform raised to the windows of my truck shell so I could see out the window. Anyway, I went to bed, and then I woke up later. Out of my window, across Mammoth, Mammoth Creek, there was a full moon, and I could see a woman walking down the path. She wore what looked to be a white nighty to me. I only remember thinking about how beautiful she was. And when I woke up in the morning, I remember thinking, what the hell was she doing out there in the middle of the night, walking around alone? Really strange to me at the time. And I will never forgive you guys for putting the vision of hermaphrodite long skulls into my head, but I do love your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Snakes! <laughs> Yeah, those are weird experiences, man. Uh, but I'm interested, like you said, you heard about this on some other podcast. What was it? That, I mean, it sounds like a classic woman in white story, which is, I mean, uh, so many places that are supposed to be haunted have, you know, a woman in white ghost. I mean, this is a, it's a classic apparition. I wonder how many people, like, m these missing people from, you know, like, the stories... Uh, uh, missing 411 get that feeling yeah before they vanish right and like ignore it yeah yeah the oh. feeling of like something doesn't want me here yeah right yeah and then instead of leaving you're just like what nah, i'm just i'm just yeah or you run into the woods like panicked mm. i don't know but yeah that's a that's a good point and yeah thanks for those experiences man there's that one with the scanning that's really interesting yeah yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Your spleen looks good. <laughs> All right. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. This is... Um, ooh, this one's really long. Really long. Wow. I cannot read that. Okay, that's way too long. Sorry, buddy. Uh, let's see. This is from... Well, I'll just get the beginning, but man, I just realized how ridiculously long this is. But it's from Ivan... And he says, it's called Hidden History of the Human Race. Comments. It says, greetings, snake bros and snake sister. I am writing to you from New Zealand, so please excuse any differences in spelling. But as a former British colony, which wasn't settled by convicts like Australia, we still use the Queen's English down here. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it probably doesn't sound like that. Although most of the time we speak and write Kiwi English, which is mostly unintelligible to anyone other than Kiwis. Anyway, with that being said, I have been listening to your show for about a year now and enjoy your brand of informed ignorance expressed with levity and humility. <laughs> I appreciate the way that you interrogate a subject with insightful questions, which help the listener delineate between what's actually been established as factually accurate and what's really just a bunch of skirptard opinion. <laughs> I especially enjoy the book reports, which is something that sets your show apart from other podcasts that cover a lot of the same subjects. Having now listened to part four of Hidden History of the Human Race, I thought your discussion about why so much of the earlier discoveries were rejected and why the current neo-Darwinist paradigm is defended so vocif vociferously identified the overarching reason which we see throughout the history of science. Namely, whenever a theory or paradigm is established, which then becomes the scientific consensus, 
it is extremely difficult to change it or for its adherents to publicly acknowledge that the theory is in crisis or has deficiencies in its expl explanatory powers. This is very much the situation today. The following quote from the philosopher Thomas Nagel encapsulates the issue nicely. The materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. Oh. Contrary to the way the theory is presented in the popular science press and general media, scientists have recognized for some time now, especially since the discovery of DNA and the advances in our ability to analyze microbiological systems, that the theory has serious problems. And he's got a quote here. For example, in November 2016, the Royal Society in London held a conference called New Trends in Evolutionary Biology. The headline talk was given by evolutionary theorist Professor Gerd Mueller, and his talk was entitled Explanatory Deficits of the Modern Synthesis. As part of that talk, he listed the following five explanatory deficits. Phenotypic complexity, uh, phenotypic novelty, non-gradual modes of transition, non-genetic factors of change, and biases in the generation of variation. The key takeaway from that list is that this covers everything of significance that needs explaining in the history of life on Earth and therefore should be explained by Darwin's theory. Then, a couple of years later in Salzburg, Austria, a meeting was held entitled Evolution, Genetic Novelty slash Genomic Variations by RNA Networks and Viruses. The headline from that meeting was, quote, for more than a half century, it has been accepted that new genetic information is mostly derived from random error-based events. Now it is recognized that errors cannot explain genetic novelty and complexity, unquote. Mm. So probably the biggest issue, which speaks to the points raised in Hidden History of the Human Race, is that the fossil record itself does not support the theory. To quote from Chief Scarptard Richard Dar Dawkins, <laughs> <laughs> quote, Evolution not only is a gradual process as a matter of fact, it has to be gradual if it is to do any explanatory work, unquote. However, what the fossil record actually shows is long periods of stasis punctuated by discontinuities and an absence of transitional fossils. Again, contrary to the way the theory is presented as an established fact, supported by indisputable evidence, the reality is that there are still no observed examples of one species gradually evolving into a distinct, distinctly different one. The fossil record cannot show even one example of a finely graded series of intermediates moving from one form to a distinctly different one. The closest that it comes to is that in a small number of cases where five or so forms can be imaginatively arranged to suggest a possible evolutionary pathway. A favorite example often cited is the evolution of the whale from an ancestral land mammal. But even in this case, there are only five or six intermediates posited, and it would have required many more gradually evolving transitional forms. Furthermore, from studies of population genetics, there does not appear to be enough time for the purported transitions to take place. This is the waiting time problem. There is a known rate at which any beneficial mutation becomes fixed in any given population. And then there is the problem of the hundreds if not thousands of irreducibly complex systems in whales that would make their gradual, gradual evolution impossible. To quote another Skirptard on this subject, we must conclude that there are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical system, only a variety of wishful speculations. This is from Franklin Harold, professor emeritus of biochemistry at Colorado State. However, even if the transition were perfectly documented with intermediate forms, it still would not answer the how questions. How did the features needed for fully aquatic environment originate? How would the hind limbs of a sea lion type creature turn into a fluke, which is very different? How would a male's testicles become simultaneously internalized and surrounded by countercurrent heat exchange systems? How would a female develop specialized nursing organs to inject milk forcibly into her calf? Indeed, why would any of these changes occur? To use the sea lion example, they are already well adapted to their amphibious lives. As a final point to all this whale talk, it's interesting to go back and look at what Darwin himself had to say on the subject. This is what Darwin wrote in the first edition of Origin of Species regarding the observations of North American black bears. Quote, Swimming for hours with widely open mouth, thus catching, like a whale, insects in the water. Even in so extreme a case as this, if the supply of insects were constant 
and if better adapted competitors did not already already exist in the country, I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered, by natural selection, more and more aquatic in their structure and habits, with larger and larger mouths, till the creature was produced as monstrous as a whale, unquote. Even critics at the time laughed at how ridiculous this idea was, and so Darwin removed this passage from future editions of the book. However, we know from his private letters that he continued to believe this fanciful tale. This kind of magical thinking continues to permeate the whole field of evolutionary studies. The one place we would ex definitely expect to find actual evidence of evolution, which could be repl replicated in the lab, would be with bacteria. Their life cycles are short enough that if an experiment was run for a long time, we would expect to see, at minimum, some evidence of beneficial mutations being fixed in a population and ideally an actual transition from one type of bacteria to another. Species. Fortunately, there is such an experiment being run currently. Michigan State University biologist Richard, Richard Linsky's Long-Term Evolution Experiment, or LTEE. The LTEE is his, is his more than three decades long project in which E. coli was allowed to grow continuously in laboratory flasks simply to observe how it would evolve. As an aside, three decades is the equivalent of thousands, if not millions of years of evolution. The results have been that almost all of the beneficial mutations that were discovered to have spread through the populations of bacteria in the LTEE were ones that either blunted pre-existing genes which was decreasing their previous biochemical activity, or outright broke them. In other words, the bacteria devolved, not evolved. Mm -hmm. As I love to quote skirptards, skirptards undercutting their own theories, <laughs> here is a summary of the situation from, from bacteriologist Alan Linton. Quote, Bacteria, the simplest form of independent life, are ideal for this kind of study, with generation times of 20 to 30 minutes and populations achieved after 18 hours. But... Throughout 150 years of the science of bacteriology, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has changed into another, unquote. Additionally, to circle back to the discussion of why there is such a commitment to a theory there is, that is no more credible today than other discredited theories such as eugenics, the answer, answer lies in the fact that evolution is predicated on methodological naturalism or materialism, which are actually philosophical or metaphysical positions. It's no accident that strident critics of neo-Darwinism call it more like a religion or cult than a scientific theory. That is why any criticism is met with such hostility and critics are labeled as creationists, regardless of the merits of any actual arguments they are making. You see that exact scenario play out in the origin of life debate, even though there are a number of theories proposed, such as the RNA world hypothesis, there is no agreed upon theory supported by evidence of how life arose from merely chemical processes. At minimum, it requires a whole bunch of chemicals on the early earth to somehow magically form the first replicating molecule. Every attempt in the lab to make this happen has failed and scientists have been trying for decades. So. Even taking that history into account, the standard skirptard position is to say, quote, even though we don't know how life got started, we know that there is a materialist explanation, but we just haven't found it yet, unquote. However, that is not a scientific statement. That is a philosophical or metaphysical statement. The scientific method of inquiry is not to start with a, an a priori uh, commitment to only certain kinds of evidence and ignore anything you don't like or agree with. Furthermore, the obvious follow-up question to the skirptard is, how long do we have to wait for this materialist explanation? 50 years, 100, or 1,000? This line of reasoning is what the philosopher of science Karl Popper called promissory materialism, and it is a feature, not a bug, of the whole neo-Darwinist theory. Finally, to expand on that opening quote from Thomas Nagel, if naturalism is true, then rationality has no foundation. Darwin himself recognized the problem as he stated, quote, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind? Unquote. So, neo-Darwinism is ultimately self-refuting. If everything is the result of natural forces, then even our own thoughts are simply natural results of some or all of the four fundamental forces of physics working on the matter inside our heads. If that is so then all of our thoughts are no more rational than any other physical processes, and we have no basis for believing them to be valid or true, including, of course, neo-Darwinism itself. Hence the realization that it is entirely self-refuting and why Nagel's statement that Darwin's conception of nature is almost certainly false rings true. <laughs>
Sorry for rambling on so long. I know you have a backlog of emails to read, so I totally understand if you decide not to read this email on the show. I just hope it can add something to the discussion around the issues raised by the book reading of Hidden History of the Human Race. Keep up, keep up the good work, bros. Best regards, Ivan. And P.S. Snacks! <laughs> okay, I decided to read the whole thing. It was really good. <laughs> it was really good, yeah. yeah. Well written. Yes, very well written. And yeah, I you know that, that whole... Um, I mean, there was a whole lot in here, but the, the promissory materialism, I have, uh, I'm familiar with this argument, you know, this idea that like, uh, where they say, well, we don't have the explanation yet, but we will just give us yeah, time. Yeah. Right. This is, this is something that happens in neuroscience as well with like human thought and memories and all that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, yeah, we don't have an explanation for consciousness yet, but, uh, just give us time. And we will have a totally materialist explanation for it eventually. So stop looking at any other theories because those are bullshit. It's going to be materialism as soon as we figure it out. <laughs> and that, that's, that's really, you know, the, the, the question of looking for a materialist explanation for consciousness, uh, that's fine. But to say that there will be one and so all other avenues of possible explanations are worthless because the answer is certainly going to be the materialist one is the problem. Yeah. That's the problem, right? And it's this, that's what he calls the, you know, the promissory materialist explanation. Yeah. We don't have it yet, but we will, and it's going to be a materialist one, so stop looking at other stuff. Yeah. You know, don't fund anything else, all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, and there, you know, I, I always see when we get into these type of debates people send us you know like oh look at this bottle fly evolution thing and look at this bacterial evolution thing and um so you're you're implying that uh these experiments have not worked and you're you've got quotations and actual names for them so that's really interesting i'll have to dig into some of this stuff more more deeply all right yeah that was great email yeah really good are we done um I, I don't have any. I don't have any more emails. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a ton. <laughs> Should we take a break? Probably yeah, probably. Break, yeah. All right. We'll be right back, guys. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, and uh, we are going to begin again down the rabbit hole, rabbit hole. <laughs> so this is always cool when you get into a conversation with somebody who's new to this type of um, research, I guess. Um, how do you approach somebody? That's what I always, I always wonder, and I, and I always try different methods. Yeah, to do it, you know. Well, let's let's start out with. Uh, I mean, if if this is going to be used for possible new people, new listeners, let's let's start out with actual introductions. So I'm Russ Allen, and you are Kyle Allen. Kyle Allen, we're brothers, and we started this podcast because we we've been having these kinds of conversations, exploring mysteries, ancient sites, uh, aliens, you know, conspiracies, all kinds of stuff with each other for years and uh and then we both started listening to podcasts and we got interested in the conversations people were having with each other through this medium and we decided you know we should try try doing one ourselves and kyle already had the studio because he does music um <clears throat> and uh so we already had a lot of the equipment and kyle had a lot of the skills to be able to record it so we didn't have to learn any of that we uh, so that's why we started the show, and the the focus of the podcast is mostly ancient mysteries, but there are some modern ones like the missing person stuff. Yeah, um, and just physics in general. Science. Yeah, so we do physics. Uh, yeah, that's right, and uh, so so that's a real brief reason for the podcast. We also and who we, are. we also are joined by the Watcher. That's right, uh, Brett England, and he is we we pulled him in early in the early days because. 
Uh, there would be little facts that we yeah we needed. needed we needed an on the fly fact checker and uh, yeah it was like it was like oh what was the name of that book you know or the what was the author's name or yeah. just, you know what various was the things date like of that. this thing yeah and so after we had been publishing a number of episodes uh, the watcher was already sending us giant blocks of text like hey you got this wrong and <laughs> this is right. actually pronounced like this <laughs> and uh, actually that guy was doing this other work yep. in 1989 <laughs> uh, not what you said yep yep <laughs> and then you know throwing in his his two cents on the topics and we were just like hey you're a perfect fit you know yeah uh, because and because he also was involved in a lot of the conversations we used to have oh too. yeah we were just like yeah okay why don't you uh why don't you join the show as a you know, as a as a show observer and a watcher and a uh, like on the fly fact checker, and uh, it's been it's been really it really helped the quality of the show for sure. Yeah, that's right. So that's who we are. Yeah. So then, all uh, the music, all the music for the show is made in house. I probably should put that in every description because so many yeah. people ask the question, "How do I get this?" So all the music is in house. It's not none of it is none of it is sourced from any third party. It's all caught, and I, I really like how Jeff. So we have a Discord. Uh, server and Jeff, the guy who runs the Discord, he had the greatest way of saying he's like the bumper songs for the podcast are Kyle's equivalent of musical doodles, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. So it's like they're That's not great. they're not complete songs, so they're not published anywhere, you know, because they're they're like he said they're like Kyle's equivalent of musical doodles. And it was like the perfect thing. I'm like, dude, I can totally use all this stuff that's yeah. been sitting in <laughs> Did the you trash can. Say crap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pull it out of the trash and use it on the show. That's right. I've, I've just I've just not hit the lead on the trash can button. <laughs> so I pulled it all out of there, and it was perfect because it's you know I use a one minute chunk of a song, and some of the songs are you know five six minutes long, so I can get different bits and pieces yeah. of the songs. And that's right. Anyway, yeah. And the the uh, the voice that you hear at the beginning that's Kyle's wife. That's right. So she does all the Laura. She Laura, and she does all the intros for the shows. And she joined us for the entire Gods of Eden book report. That's right. Which was very special, and hopefully um, she'll be able to join us again at some point in the future for another book report or something. Because it's great to have her in the studio as a you know, she's got you know different insights and interesting questions. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's the team. It's basically Kyle. and she manages Holocene, which is our LLC that we use for uh, tours and other that's things right. that we're doing. Yeah, she's a ver she's a great organizer and uh, yeah, so she manages the whole Holocene team, which we do the tours with. So uh, yeah, so that's the team. You got the <clears throat> you got Brett who's the watcher and myself, Russ and Kyle. We're the brothers. We're the hosts of the show, and then Laura who does the intros and a lot of the background stuff. Okay, so. How did you get into all this? <laughs> Man. <laughs> well, what was your first... I mean, because I remember when we were kids, you were you were reading Sitchin. Yeah, okay. So Sitchin, the, the 12th planet, was yeah, probably, 12th planet. probably the first book I ever read that came close to these, these topics. Uh, and that was when I was 16 or 17 years old. We were still living in Georgia yeah. at the time. And uh, yeah, I remember reading that thing out there on the back porch... You know, and just being like, Whoa. I remember you showing me the image of the guy. Uh, um, I can't remember his name. It's a, it's a Central American uh, Kukul Khan or whatever his name yeah. is. And he's sitting in the rocket ship shaped thing and he's holding the levers oh. and all that kind of stuff. It was in the book. Yeah, that's that's the that's the lid of the sarcophagus at the at, at the at the that they found beneath a pyramid or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's not that's not Kukul Khan. That's somebody else. I, I can't, can't remember, remember the guy's name, but yeah. Yeah, that's a weird one, and it like looks like he's manipulating levers, and he's kind of in this weird seated position. Yeah, who was that watcher? Yeah. And that guy, his his body was in that sarcophagus, and it's very large. It's uh, he oh. was an extremely tall person, especially compared to like the average Mayan, which is another interesting. Mm. And you know what? I the reason I know that is because I was recently reading a lot of Jacques Vallée, and he mentions that sarcophagus. You know, and talking about the ancient aliens, he was like, look, this dude was like over six feet, whereas the average Mayan is like five feet tall. Mm -hmm. So this dude is like, you know, and I can't, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember what his name was, but yeah, it's a complicated name. But yes, Sitchin. Uh, and then there was, there's also the comparative mythology, right? So we both That's were- That's my favorite yeah. thing here. <clears throat> so we were both raised in a Christian household, you know, so familiarity with biblical texts or whatever- and you know, like standard standard with that kind of thing is it's when you're raised into it, it's it's uh, it's kind of a belief system and a religion. But as we 
began to delve more and more into these topics, we transitioned from that into looking more at the biblical text as just another, not just, but a, a, in another collection of ancient texts in which people from a long time ago were trying to explain their experiences with something that they took to be supernatural, mm -hmm. right? So lo most ancient texts are like this, especially, and you know, ones that are religious based or ones that are now used to support religions. Uh, but you got to look at these in, in different ways. Like there's, there's a number of texts in the Bible that are just letters. That's right. Written between people. There's other texts that are that are like somebody trying to lay out a set of rules, doctrine to live by. Yeah. There's words of wisdom. There's songs. Right. That are just lyrics. Yeah. Basically, there's yeah. you know, and then there's like to me the 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 biblical text, the parts that I'm the most interested in are the Old Testament sort of the origin story, you know, yeah. uh, the the historical text. So that's. That's a lot different than someone writing a letter and talking philosophy with somebody or laying down some rules for the the new, you know, yeah. That's the new right. ruler, right? So yeah. all that stuff's in there, but it's it's these it's the origin stories that are and the historical accounts uh that when you start to look at other texts from completely different cultures and stuff. And you see so many similarities. It's, it's like, okay, this is, uh, yeah. I also remember a big, like, okay. So a big thing that happened to me that really started driving my interest in looking deeper into the connections between all these kinds of ancient texts from all over the world and legends, mythology, whatever you might want to call them, whether they were oral traditions initially that were eventually written down was, when I started to see processional numbers kind of inserted into these documents, like this was a big deal to me because I was like, why is this, you know, like first you start learning about the precession of the equinoxes, which is this enormously long and astronomical cycle. Uh, and it has a bunch of numbers associated with it, you know, and those numbers are specific. And then you, you're, you're, you'll be reading some, collection of ancient texts or legends or myths and you see like these very specific numbers inserted into these documents and they are all processional yeah you know just... and that and I, I started to wonder like well what 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 does this mean like why are these numbers in here uh you know and you see it's, it's like i think gordon white was talking about this i can't remember if it was him or somebody else but somebody you know the the idea that these were that before these were written down, these were like songs or stories told around the campfire, you know, when we were in our hunter gatherer stage, like they're very, they have these very ancient origins. Well, that, that, that is possibly true for a lot of st traditions and stories, but it doesn't make sense to put very specific numbers into stories like that. You know, you say there were a lot of warriors. You don't say there were 144,000 and yeah. they were behind 72 doors, you know, that, 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 that doesn't, that's, that's weird for telling around the campfire. I guess. And when you see that those numbers are processional, that ha they, they, in other words, they point specifically to this grand astronomical cycle. And that that astronomical cycle is connected in a lot of ways with, you know, with, with how things change on Earth, not just having to do with the climate or uh, certain aspects of nature, but also specifically to humans and how they respond to the world, you know, that, that's, that's interesting. So then you're talking about yugas, right? The, the concept of the golden ages versus the non-golden ages, you know? And so like supposedly right now we're at the bottom of the cycle where, or maybe we're just coming up out of the, the age of iron or the Kali yuga and going back up the circle, going towards the golden age, yeah, which would be at the top, which is, you know, unfortunately, 12,000 years away at this point. <laughs> so the idea that these long astronomical cycles were observed in some way by our ancient ancestors and they considered them to be extremely important is a key to sort of, in some ways, to make sense of some of the things that the ancient texts are talking about and how they looked to the heavens for the explanation of things that they saw on earth, which is how you get to this sort of uh, mystical phrase, as above, so below, you know, and as below, so above. In other words, that somehow the heavens are mirrored 
on Earth. Uh, and I think that the the this really struck me because as above, so below is like a it, it's alchemical or it's it's a magical phrase. Um, I mean, it's 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 There's used in it's used in architecture, right? But the thing is, is that but when you when you begin to connect, there's a it, very common Christian phrase that is used all the time. That's the same thing on earth as it is in heaven. There you go. That's right. It's the same phrase. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right? But it's just that different words, a different way of expressing it, and you right. Know, you know, yeah. From the alchemists and all this. Yeah. You could j just switch it around and say, "As it is in heaven, so it is on earth." Yeah. And that's as above, so below. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. That's right. Yeah, so that that really started bothering me, you know, where when I was looking at these numbers and this large cycle and how they how these numbers just will, you know, you're reading some ancient text and you just see a random 72 in there and you're just like, "What? <laughs> what is this? What why is this in here?" You know. So that was a big part of it and that that also taught me to kind of cross-reference these texts with each other because if they're all showing the same numbers, then it seems like they're talking about this similar cycle. Now that, you know, in, in some cases you might think, well, multiple people in different places in the earth or across thousands of years in different cultures are observing the same cycle, right? It's something you can observe from anywhere on the planet. So it isn't necessarily strange that they all saw these same numbers and then put them into their documents. Uh, but the problem is, is that with procession, it, it, it takes some doing to recognize that it's taking place. Yeah. Uh, now the question is, is can you do it with basic materials? Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you, but you would need to know that you need to, to do it in the first place, right? This is a question of like, how did this, how did this even start? Who know? who is the first person to notice? Wow. On this particular day of the year, at this exact hour, that particular star is not in the same place. It was 72 freaking years ago. Yeah. Who's the person that first notices that? <laughs> Yeah, well, when you you know when you decide to build an observatory in whatever whatever fashion, whether it's standing stones or yeah, you, know, um, you you're doing it because not all the stars in the sky move at the same rate. That's right. You know that's that's noticeable without building anything. Yeah. So the first thing you're going to notice if you're paying any kind of attention is that there are wandering stars. Yeah, and they're always on the same track. And that track moves along with the track of the moon and, you know, yeah. the sun. And so you build something to to sort of monitor that. And because that whole track raises and lowers throughout the year, you have to observe it on the same day every year. Yeah. To see what's different that year. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I guess a couple of generations go by <laughs> after <laughs> using that. I mean, you got to have something pretty well established. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You got to be able to keep records. Yeah. Uh, you know, even if they're oral records, right? Even if you're just you're just telling your protege, like, hey, you know, here's what's happened and here's how I'm keeping track. But yeah, like ancient cultures have kept track of the movements of the sun and the moon. We know this for a long time. I mean, there's the thing like the, uh, uh, what's it called? The sun dagger in Chaco Canyon, mm -hmm. you know, which is unfortunately now gone. It's been, it was destroyed, uh, I think by a natural, natural problem. It collapsed. But the point is that, they were tracking using light and shadow and, you know, a system of rock and caves, basically the movement of the sun, the analemma, I think is how you pronounce it, which is the figure eight that the sun makes in the sky uh, if you look at it a specific way. So they were, people were very interested in what happened in the sky and this gets involved in a lot of their ancient texts. And so we've talked to David Matheson about this. He's big on that. He, he thinks that the source of all myths is some kind of, overall uh, and incredibly ancient uh, set of star myths, stories told using the sky as the canvas. Yeah. And he thinks that most, that, that, that pretty much every story you can find in religions is a version of a star myth, a story told using constellations and, and figures that you can see in the sky as the backdrop. And people have, and over time, it's just been lost that uh, that these are that these are stories told uh, not about real people or events or places, but actually about 
that their their stories told using the sky and the, the stories movements of the stars and right the heavens, and yeah. and that the, that the stories aren't necessarily trying to tell you that these were real events that took place but are more about giving you maybe a moral background or some kind of spiritual enlightenment um yeah he's never been really clear on that except that well, he thinks that it's supposed to be in in he, he thinks that it's supposed to be instructing us on how to be better humans right yeah. and to be in touch with the spiritual side of life or our spiritual selves uh, and how to maximize the benefits of being a, a, a human person on this planet. And there's and, obvious connections with, with the, the narratives of these ancient texts and the stories that are more than just the numbers that are connected to the heavenly bodies, right? I mean, just, you know, you take away the, the uh, cognitive meanings of uh, the heavens and you're just talking about what's out there in space, and you start to look at the at the text in that with that idea in mind, and it it's like, oh, okay. These, you know, if you're using that as a metaphor, yeah, what's going on in heaven, right? The movements of the stars and the movements of the planets, and of course, you know, with um, like Greek mythology, there's all these, you know, they're talking about planets, yeah, in a lot of cases, yeah, uh, and they give them. You know, they personify them, give them character, you know, attributes and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, but like, again, with, you know, my background with in Christianity, it's like there are there are clear signs as to the age, the like uh, the zodiacal ages. Yeah. That they were in in certain parts of the story. So there's uh, Ram imagery there's yeah bull imagery bull imagery yeah. yeah and you can tell like they're moving from one age to another yeah and all the imagery changes and then there's you know pisces the fish yep which is 2000 years old when we entered the the age of pisces and now we're entering the age of aquarius yeah year 0 in the gregorian cha- calendar is basically the beginning of the age of pisces yeah. sort of yeah close enough yeah it's close right yeah. And then of course there were prophets being you know, like the you know it's coming. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> They're out there telling you that the age is changing. That's and, right. And then of course there's a new doctrine that's adopted. Yeah. As it's, there's just you know so it's 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 built in. So why is all this astronomy built in to all of these yeah. texts? Yeah. And isn't it interesting that the you know I mean we we've, we've brought this up many times but the the symbol of Christianity often is that very simple fish yeah. right it's pisces and you got to change it to the water bearer now right yeah now it's the yeah now it's the water bearer so does does all this mean something more about our history that's really what we're about on this podcast really like you know what is it cuz we have you know there's a standard story whether whether you're a religious person or a non-religious person who, you know, there, there's still a standard story that's kind of taught. Uh, and the question that we go through on this podcast is how much of that standard story is correct and how much, how much really mystery is there in this that needs to be looked at closer? Yeah. So one of the ways we do that is to explore in detail uh, ancient sites. You know, we do this through text, through talking about it, through reading books, uh, through various papers, uh, other researchers, you know, Graham Hancock, Ben from Uncharted X has done, I mean, he's been to a lot of these places and he's got fantastic video, um, you know, and he's convinced uh, that in some cases, these civilizations that we're looking at are, they're more like, it's more like they're legacies of a much older culture or in some cases, they may be found places that were inhabited by a later culture. Like, in other words, that these some of these places may be ruins of something much, much older. And they've been attributed to a much more recent culture. That what actually, whereas what actually happened is that much more recent culture re-inhabited these spots and learned from them and developed their own culture based on the imagery from these very ancient ruins. And possibly texts left over in some cases. So we explore that a lot on the top, on the podcast is, you know, what, what is there, is, are, are we looking at something like an Atlantean civilization? Maybe not Atlantis itself being a city somewhere in the, in the Atlantic ocean, but the idea 
of Atlantis being that there was a very ancient civilization that was almost completely destroyed in some kind of cataclysm a long time ago to the point to where everybody almost completely forgot about it, right? And so with that, we've gone into a bunch of research on, well, what was the most recent cataclysmic event on the planet? And then you get into a bunch of geology and we have the- Inter Randall Carlson. Right, Inter Randall Carlson (laughs) and the end of the last ice age, which was relatively recent, geologically speaking, only 12,000, you know, 12,000 years ago, basically, 12,900, 12,800 years ago, was the end of the Younger Dryas. Uh, the, it, and the Younger Dryas was basically a resurgence of the Ice Age that had been for a long time declining before that. Um, so, say, between thirty and 40,000 years ago, the ice expanded to its maximum extent, and then it began a long, slow decline. And then something happened that ended that decline and caused it to resurge to almost as big, almost as much ice as it had been in it, in its maximum, you know, what they call the last glacial maximum late or yeah, the late glacial maximum. And, uh, and that period lasted for about 1200 years and then it ended abruptly and all the ice melted again and dumped all that water into the oceans. And this was a catastrophic event that, uh, where basically the younger driest period, that 1200, that 1200 years or so also coincides with an enormous, extinction event of a lot of animals and also a bottleneck in the human population. Yeah. And so Randall's point, and, you know, we, we, we've done a bunch of looking into this with him, uh, through our podcast with him on, on Cosmographia is about, you know, the, the destruction that was wrought on the planet was so immense that it's almost, it's, it's so difficult to conceive uh, that if there was a civilization that existed at the time, not something that had, you know, it doesn't have to be a civilization that had spaceships or, or even electricity, just, just a large maritime globe trotting civilization, people who were able to sail the oceans and, uh, chart the, you know, the, the lands and the waters and were, had possibly colonies and were trading with each other. And, you know, basically a large maritime civilization, uh, which would be considered extremely advanced for something that far back, uh, they they would have been completely wiped out, and there would be almost no trace of them whatsoever. Yeah, when they you know they talk about the sea levels rising four hundred feet after the the yeah. end of the last ice age, That's right. and when you look at civilization today, all of the centers of civilization are near water. That's right. And they're near sea level. They're yeah, either they're on, on a river lines or on rivers. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, why should we think that we would have very much left over after that type of catastrophic destruction, rise of sea of 400 feet? I mean, we we would need to be looking out at the edges of the continental shelves. That's right. And, you know, after 12,000 years of uh, sediment and, and... probably earthquakes and yep. uh, wave action currents all yeah. that kind of stuff i mean who knows what's down there and how how deeply it's buried yeah that's right and really you know unless it was made of stone it's probably not going to be preserved that's right and the rivers especially in 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 north america the river systems are all uh they're all what are called underfit you know underfit rivers basically you have a little river and i mean the the river can be really big actually like you know relatively speaking like you got the mississippi or something and it's got its own channel and that channel is within a much more enormous channel sometimes miles and miles wide uh and the reason for that for most of these rivers in north america being like that is because the meltwater from the last ice age had to flow through those channels and it did catastrophically in some cases hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second carved these gigantic enormous channels and and if there was any if there was a river there before and there was any civilization on or near that river it's gone i mean it's completely gone you know any city any one of our cities that was in a river I mean, when, when we're going through this with Randall, you'll see like a whole city is in one of these channels. And you know that if the same thing happened today as what happened then, you know, a large amount of ice melts catastrophically and all that water flows through there, the city's going to be completely gone. It's totally eradicated. Yeah. And I've spent 
thousands of hours scouring the surfaces of the land to looking for artifacts. Yeah. Uh, mostly arrowheads, flint artifacts, stone artifacts, and um, occasionally on a hilltop somewhere where there's no natural flint, you might find uh, an arrowhead or just like a piece, you know, yeah. of an artifact or some worked flint, a sign that somebody made this thing. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, you're not going to see anything. But as soon as you get near a body of water, that's where you are more likely to find them. That's where uh, campsites were. I mean, yep. you know, you just have to think, like, where would you camp? Where would you yeah. spend your time? Where are the animals Yeah, <clears throat> that you're hunting and living by? Yeah. So it's, you know, in, in, in our case, when there's a big flood, you can go out after the flood and you have a better likelihood of finding an artifact because it's been uncovered after being buried from some previous flood. Yeah, that's right. They get washed out of the bank or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So it's, it's, and it's really interesting too, when you get into that, it's like how, how many thousands of years is proposed for some of these, these stone artifacts here. Um, we're getting all the way up to, you know, it's like, I don't know, Two or three thousand years after the end of the Younger Dryas, we have we have these artifacts that are fairly common, yeah, around the place, and um, it's they're they're getting washed out on the riverbanks, and they're under tens of feet in some cases of of sediment, yeah, and so it's you know there, there's just so much when you start going down that rabbit hole of how much stuff has moved around in the Holocene period, which is this last 12,000 years, um, there, there have been some gigantic floods right. that are not even anywhere close to the scale of the meltdown floods. Right. That's right. I mean, we farm on a, on a river basin, basically, that's just this gigantic flat area. And it's all flooded. Anywhere deposits. we've excavated there, you get down... Six feet, you hit river gravel. Right. <laughs> yeah. Way far away from the river. Yeah. Right? So you never know. There could have, That could have been a campsite because the riverbank was there at some point. And these things weave around inside this much larger, what is called the, the river basin. Yeah. And who knows where it was back then. So that's... that's uh, yeah, and it's, it's part of the idea of... So going again about, you know... Geologically speaking and evolutionarily speaking, there's this idea of uniformitarianism, <clears throat> which is basically the, the concept that these processes take long periods of time and they happen very slowly and gradually. So you don't see them take place, but over long periods of time, there's large amounts of change. Except that more and more evidence is coming out that what we actually have is something more like what they call punctuated equilibrium which is where you have long periods of static uh, where it doesn't change, really. And, and then you have some catastrophic event where everything changes very quickly in a matter of days. Yeah. And you can easily see this in looking at just, you know, local regional or, yeah, regional floods. Uh, you may have a creek bed near your house or something like that, and... A little bit of water flows through it, or maybe it's dry a lot of the time and it doesn't change. You know, it's just sitting there. This You see this. You walk past it. You see the same rocks every day. They don't move. You know, the water doesn't change anything. It goes up and down a tiny bit, depending on if you're getting more or less rain. Sometimes it's totally dry if you're in a drought. Sometimes it's got a lot of water in it if, they're, if you're getting good rain. But then one day you get a whole bunch of rain. And then suddenly it changes. You know, once the flood is over, you go back there and all those familiar rocks you've been seeing for years are totally gone. And sometimes it's not even there anymore. The creeks change direction. Right. And <laughs> the creeks in a different spot. You know, it's definitely it's 10 feet away from where it used to be. Uh, so that's that's the idea. This is this is a, you know, catastrophic change or punctuated equilibrium. And you can also understand this in in your in, in, like in the life of a person, <clears throat> you know, there's. There are long static periods, you know, where there is change, but it's very slow and gradual. But then one day you get in an accident, you wreck your bicycle or you have a car wreck or something like that. And you break a whole bunch of bones and, you know, you have catastrophic change to your entire physical body. 
more change than you've had over the past 20 years can take place in a matter of seconds, right? It's a catastrophic event. And the other thing that there is in geology is the concept of uh, scale invariance. That, uh, that, that, that no matter what scale you look at things, they, they, you can see the same patterns, right? So scale invariance implies that we can take this local catastrophic event thing and then long periods of static, uh, static no change and scale it up to the entire globe in terms of large global, not just regional or local catastrophic events, but global catastrophic events that take place that affect the entire planet and cause an enormous amount of change over a very short period of time. So one, one good example of this is the, the 65 million year ago asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, right? That is an accepted catastrophic event that caused an extinction event that uh, and this isn't this isn't fully studied, but how it changed the surface of the globe is not really is not totally clear. Oh, but there's a story that I had that I didn't do today, but it's where they've now discovered these gigantic ripples. Oh yeah, deep down in the crust. Yeah, that's right. Uh, radiating out from that from the Chicxulub crater. Mm. That's right. I saw that article too. They're really yeah. deep. Yeah. yeah. They're just, I mean, just, <laughs> I don't know. I was just. Yeah. So that's, that's an accept. So, so in geology, which is mostly a uniformitarian, you know, they have this, this, they call it the doctrine of, uni of uniformity, which the basic idea is that, you know, that, that, that most processes that take place are analogous to the processes that happen right now. And we shouldn't use, we shouldn't look at certain geological features and try to explain them using catastrophic forces. Instead, we should try to explain them using the kinds of forces we see at play on the surface today, which are slow and gradual. But there, more and more, there's, it's coming to be accepted that there have been catastrophic events that have drastically changed the surface. And they're more frequent yeah. than previously estimated. Right. So one thing about the Younger Dryas, the, mo the end of the most recent Ice Age, is that it was, it was a very catastrophic event. And this is a difficult, this has been a long fight in, in academia over this <clears throat> over this event because most most academics in geology have wanted to sort of stretch it out as long as possible and i mean you know if you if you read literature from 100 years ago they thought that it was hundreds of thousands of years that this you know that this that this that the ice age was ending but as you get more and more recent and there's more and more field data that time has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until now there's a lots of data that shows that it was extremely fast geologically speaking and uh and that, and that leaves open a lot of questions on how, where did the energy come from to do this? Yeah. You know. The energy paradox. Right. There's an energy paradox because uh, you have a certain amount of ice. You need a certain amount of energy to melt all that ice. Right. And the problem is, is that there's no known, like, uniform, local geological forces that can put out that much energy to melt all that ice all, all at once. None that we wouldn't see clear signs of like right. some like ridiculous enormous amounts massive, of volca yeah. volcanoes yeah that's right yeah. so it implies that there were that there was extraterrestrial uh sources for the energy meaning Exigenia. impacts yeah. yeah so if there was a large impact or a series of impacts that ended the last ice age that puts gigantic global changing uh impact events much more recent in our history something that actual modern humans lived through and then when you look back at the ancient texts it seems like that's what many of them are talking about yeah fire from the sky right and then it's also interesting because there a lot of them are saying and it will happen again that's right which is also cyclical, true yeah right you talk to any astronomer and they'll say it's not a matter of if but when this will happen again Right. It, it isn't a question of will we ever get hit by another it's, large yes, meteor. This prediction of the destruction of the world at the end of. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, it's it's going to come and nobody knows when it will be. That's right. No one knows the day or the hour. That's right. And yet it will be. It is coming because what is known is that these things are cyclical. Right. And, you know, like one of one of the interesting things I think about that is is uh, the, the whole comet Inky you know, connection. Yes. Yeah. This gigantic cyclical, you know, this, this thing's orbiting the sun. 
essentially, and it takes a long time for it to come back, but it's left with like a fragmentary tail, and you just never know. When yeah, and there's been those recent stories of the, uh, some other enormous either Kuiper or Oort cloud body. Yeah, that's a gigantic been comet that's like been eased into our solar system, you know, into the that's going to be cruising in to the interior. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this process has just begun or they're just now noticing it. So it's probably tens of thousands of years away. But the fact is that if this has just happened just now, it's been happening in the past yeah. as well. So, you know, is there a long line of these things all on their long and slow way into the inner solar system? And in other words, this one that we've just noticed, it's tens of thousands of years off. But tens of thousands of years ago, this happened to another one. And it's it's close to getting, you know, to, to coming into the solar system, beginning its process of breaking up and then leaving a whole bunch of debris in the inner solar system, which we can start running into. Yeah. And, and if, did that happen 12,000 years ago, which is what would, would have caused the uh, series of impacts that ends the Ice Age? And you could imagine that if you witness something like that take place that, I mean, changed the entire globe catastrophically, wiped out most people wiped out civilization, you might want to tell that story yeah. uh, to the f you know future generations. You might want that story to be carried on to for a number of reasons. One, to remember what came before, but also to warn about what could come again That's in the future. Right. Will be coming yeah. again. Yeah. And so this yeah. is like you, you start to look at this type of thing and see, okay, you can kind of grasp now why maybe certain documents were so important to people in the ancient past that they went to great lengths to preserve them uh, to their own even, you know, yeah, imminent death. That's right. To preserve these these documents that are that are talking about just that. Yeah. The time before and the time soon to come. <laughs> That's right. That no the one end knows is yet. nigh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so that is a really interesting way of looking, I think, at the at the ancient texts. And when you when you put that when you have that in your mind when you're going through some of these things and you you can just see the imagery. It's like, yes, this is this is one way you might describe a fiery cometary fragment coming down is a chariot of fire. Yeah. Or yeah, you know, whatever. It's yep. it, there's there's so many different ways that it's I mean, I don't know, they just pop out of the text. You know, you're reading stuff and you're like, oh man, that, that yeah. could be a comet. That's right. It could be a meteor. You know, they describe it as a dragon. Yeah. You know, it's sky serpents, uh <laughs> broom stars. Yeah. There's all kinds of imagery that you, you And there you know, there there's this sort of uh, negative connotation to one being in the sky, you know, in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is a, um, por you know, it's portentous. That's right. right. Yeah. This is a, that's right. Imminent doom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. Why, Satan why shall appear as an angel of light. Why would that be? <laughs> yeah. Why would that be if we've never experienced one? Right. And they would be like, oh, look at the pretty flower sky thing. <laughs> that's right. No. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We probably should take a break. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we should. We, We're way yeah. over. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll be right back. Yeah. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And just to put a lie to what I said about all music being created in-house, this was actually made by a fan of the show. Uh, he sent this in when we were doing, what was it? We were doing, uh, I don't remember. Don't we were doing, me. We were doing one called of the, the Texas Cobra Dance. Yeah, we were doing one of the Egypt books. Uh, Chris Dunn's oh, okay. probably um, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt or the Giza Power Plant or something. There's only two... Donated songs that I've played on the pod, on the podcast. This is one, and the yeah. other one was from uh, um, Scotty Baldwin. 
That's right. Thank you, Scotty. Yeah. The old Xing Yang Serpent. Yeah. That's a good one. So we've gone long on both of these segments, so maybe we'll just do one more long segment and be done. I think. What? That's, yeah, that's how we'll do it. <laughs> no, because it's good, because this is just you know, a long-form conversation. But let's, okay, so let's, let's, let's take the conversation now to, um, you know, ancient aliens and that concept mm-hmm. versus ancient civilization. So the, the way we look at this now, like, you know, anyone who is probably has coming to this podcast and has an interest in this subject has probably heard of the ancient alien stuff. I mean, obviously there's the very popular history channel television series, but the concept that, you know, did were some of these ancient civilizations and the, and maybe these mysterious structures influenced by extraterrestrial contact. And, uh, yeah, you know, that, that is an, a, a kind of an alluring idea, uh, at the beginning, and I don't totally discount the concept of paleo contact, the idea that ancient humans may have been contacted in some way by something non human, whether that was actual flesh and blood extraterrestrials coming here in nuts and bolts craft or something more strange than that. I don't know how to put it, but you know, the, the, there is this idea that, that, when was the beginning of 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 what we now think of as modern human thinking and a lot of archaeology and anthropology puts it to either what they can see in art or burial practices right so there's two concepts here of what changed in the minds of hominids that began to make them conceive of things in such a way that they can then begin to create abstract art imagery, you know, and in some cases it's, this is, we're just talking about on cave walls, but it, it, it kind of looks sudden. Now that may be an artifact of preservation. Um, but you have things like Chauvet cave, which is in Europe and it's, I don't remember the exact date. Maybe the watcher can find out, but it's 30 to 40,000 years old and it's the abs- art. Yeah, the artwork in the cave, and it's absolutely beautiful. And I think there's the quote from was it Picasso who said like we have invented nothing. Yeah, he goes in there and sees it, and he's just like, wow, whoever did this was you know. In other words, modern art has invented nothing. These people, and, and that's that's an an interesting encapsulation of uh, kind more, of the way we look at <laughs> well, and more broadly, what we see in a lot of ancient civilizations, the idea that. That Sumerians, which is one of the, f- the, which is pretty much the first accepted urban civilization, people who built cities, right? That Sumerians basically invented everything that we have now that w- that w- that we include in our civilization. The idea of like common laws, you know, plumbing, uh, beer, writing, beer, yeah, all that stuff. Well, I mean, there was beer before, right? Didn't didn't we have? Um, I think they invented this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so watchers putting up running water, sanitation, terraced agriculture, like all, there's a huge list of things that the Sumerians quote unquote inventing. Yeah, writing is another one. Culture. Yeah, but not true. Well, that's the question. So Picasso is looking at this ancient artwork that's forty thousand years old and saying we've invented nothing. In other words. I think that broadly goes is in the same thing, like where you look at these very ancient civilizations and you say, well, in other than p- maybe in mass execution, we have invented nothing, right? Uh, in other words, in the in in the execution of the enormity of our civilization, it's that's the only difference, really. You know, some materials, right, and then later on, electricity and other advancements, but. In terms of the basis and the basics of civilization, we didn't, you know, it was invented. But, I mean, yeah, you get into 4,000 BC, it was invented. All yeah. that stuff was invented. We've just been kind of like tinkering. You look with at it. like the Baghdad battery. Right. right. Yeah. And maybe they were using it to electroplate. Right. But the point is, and they, and they, they you know, they f- use that as a dismissal. Well, it was for electroplation. You're like, okay, wait. <laughs> they made batteries to electroplate stuff <laughs> to, in 2000 BC. The point is, is that, I, you know, when you think about stuff like electricity and you're looking at ancient civilizations, well, they, you know, they did uh, I mean, we shock each other all the time without power plants, yeah. without 
And so this, the phenomenon of electricity is noticed by every person. Yeah. Now, it just takes a scientifically oriented mind, like in other words, I'm, I'm talking about um, Did we the just process the of science. Uh, I think he just bailed on us. Oh, did he? <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. The window just closed. For yeah, that, it's been doing that. Okay. You know, what I mean is the scientific method, yeah. right? Which is, you know, this process of of figuring things out, you know, process of elimination. There's a there's there's all different types of or ways that you can approach the world scientifically. And it would just take somebody who has that who's sort of oriented in that way to rule out things that are not true yeah. as they're looking into something and be curious to start studying static electricity. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and we, if you have amber, you can yeah, you can generate plenty of things. Yeah. Silk and silk and amber. And you can, and yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's all kinds of materials that you know. We've talked about this before, but the the triboelectric series, right? Any two materials that are far apart on this series, glass meaning, and silk. It's all you yeah. need. <laughs> yeah, meaning that they one wants to shed electrons, the other one wants to take them on. Yeah, and yeah, so they, they, this could be discovered. It just takes one person with an inquisitive mind yeah, and a good process of, of weeding out things that are not true. Right. To figure this out. Yeah. And of course, they need, they need a lifestyle that's not running around and butt flap with a spear yeah. that gives them time, right, to, to yeah. be able to dedicate themselves to looking into it. Right. And we see this type of activity in the 1900s um, Nikola Tesla and and uh, Thomas Edison doing this, looking into electricity, and they—I mean, the amount of discoveries these two guys made. Yeah. And of course, you know, the old Ben Franklin—you got to give him some credit, right? I mean, yeah. And there were early experiments with with the uh, Leyden jars, and you know, I, I'm remembering that the where you had the the ball of glass, was it? And then they had the crank, and then yeah. you hold the. Uh, the cloth, the cloth the on it, or whatever. So the the ball, the ball of glass is spinning with the crank, and you're holding a piece of silk on it, and it's building up static electricity. And then there's a metal chain that's mm -hmm. dragging on the top of the ball, and that's connected to this Leyden jar, which is basically a, 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 capacitor. a capacitor. And they would do this thing where they charge up the capacitor, you know, in front of everybody, and then they would completely dismantle it very carefully, but dismantle it so that, you, that, and then somebody's holding the glass jar and somebody else is holding the foil that was on the inside and somebody else is holding the, you know, all the component pieces and they'd, they're all partying and drinking and talking to each other and much later after, and after many hours, they put it all back together and then you could still shock someone with it because it, you know, they, the <laughs> component parts retained whatever, however they had built up. The, it, it, so there was, they were, they were done as party tricks, but this is, you Going know, back to your point though, this the development of the human mind to, yeah. to to this degree. The point is, is that if the human mind was sufficiently developed thirty thousand years ago to come up with this art, yeah. then it would only take one person within their lifetime with the right amenities that, to yeah. allow them to study some aspect of physics and to develop a technology. Right. Yeah. And so, I think now in modern science, they believe, uh, or I guess I don't know what. It, branch of it is but they believe that the that the human brain was pretty much the same as it is now yeah for hundreds of anatomically thousands of anatomically modern for hundreds of thousands of years yeah so it's it's when you look at it that way and then you you consider the the massive cataclysm at the end of the um last ice age it's not far-fetched that we could have had significant technological advancements far in ancient history yeah that are just gone Right. That's right. And so going back to the art and the idea of, or the question of when did this take place and what caused it? Well, it could be, like you're saying, an exceptional individual. But the idea of burial practices is a little more complicated, I think, than the idea of a, an exceptional individual. Because, and it's an interesting question, you know, but it's, it, w at what point do people begin to um uh handle the dead in such a way that implies that they believe in some kind of afterlife you know real quick i do want to say 
the Mayan king is Pakal. Yeah. We were talking Pakal. about the, in very early in the very beginning of the conversation. Right. The watcher did answer the question. Yeah. And yeah. he didn't want us to make listeners think that he didn't get that question answered. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who's inside the machine looks like he's inside a machine with levers and stuff. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Yeah, that's fine. So, so one of the one of the concepts of the the advent of the modern human mind is the is is burial practices that sort of show that there may be a concept of an afterlife. In other words, grave goods, right? So you're not just disposing of the body anymore. Now you're doing it in some sort of reverence with symbology, with the implications that there is symbolic thinking going on in the in the uh practices of disposing of the dead i don't know how else to put it right so you're you're doing something that shows a reverence uh for the end of life and the possibility of a thinking that there may be something after the end of physical life like burying people with stuff you know, to take with them to the afterlife or burying them in a, in an artful way or with the feet always facing the rising sun or something like that. Right. The, the, these kinds of concepts of burial practices. And, and now the, the, there, there's evidence that, uh, that this is very old, very, very, very old, you know, 50, 60,000 years or more, uh, much older than the art. And, you know, and, and going back to the art too, there's, there's some evidence that, uh, that art in Australia, rock art in Australia, is even older than the stuff in much older than the stuff in Europe. You know, up to seventy or eighty. And, and about years old. that, I mean, you have to imagine what surface would you paint something on if you wanted to know for sure that it was going to be here sixty thousand years in the future, <laughs> right? Yeah, or thirty, or yeah. twelve. Yeah, it's, it's got to be in a protected area that's stone, right? Yeah. yeah. And how do you know that? You know, I mean, you just can't know. Like yeah. that protected area in stone could be under the ocean mm -hmm. in 12,000 years. That's right. That protected area in stone, that dead cave, dry cave, could be a wet cave. That's right. In a thousand years. And then in three more or four more thousand years, you'll never see the art. Right. What materials do you use to make the art? You know, it's, it's just... So yeah, it's a matter it's, of it's, luck and, and yes, and so circumstance. It's, you have to realize that looking at this specific cave, like Chauvet Cave, and saying, "Okay, this is the oldest art ever found in Europe." It's yeah. actually amazing, yeah, that that art is still even there. Right? Not that people were making it. Is my yes. point? Yeah. Yep. I agree. And yeah, that cave that was a, like a well known cave. It was on a well known hiking trail and. People went in and out of the cave all the time. There was no art, you know, but then there was a, at some point, I, I don't really remember all the details of the story, but there were a couple of students, I think, and they went into the cave, on, you know, they went on a hike, they went into the cave and they got to the back of the cave and they were sitting down against a rock wall. And then one of them felt a little bit of a, a draft coming through the yeah, I've tumble heard that of rocks. Story yeah. Before too. And then they, un they eventually uncover it. And there's this whole other section of the cave that had been closed off a long time ago. There you go. And basically sealed the place almost hermetically. Not totally because there was a draft coming through, but basically sealed it. And that's why that, that art time. is still there. Yeah. And they do it now. It's they seal it off now. And you, you know, they don't let anybody in there because it's they're they're like, we have to preserve this. And to, to keep it preserved, you have to keep, keep the it. keep the, the humidity down. Yeah. yeah everything or has it to, has to be just right. It has yeah. to be just like it has been for the past twelve or thirteen or fourteen or twenty thousand years or whatever that kept that stuff preserved. Because yeah, you're right. If it had been open. The, the, the art would be gone. Yeah. And that's, you know, I know jumping all over the place here, but that's why we call this place the Tangent Cube of Science. That's right. <laughs> um, Gubekli Tepe, mm. this, this site in Turkey, um, was intentionally buried. And there's all these, you know, sort of monolithic like pillars of limestone that are, that have carvings, uh, high relief, meaning the carvings are sticking out. Yeah. Rather than just scratched into it. They're very uh, beautiful carvings, and they're all over these pillars. And the pillars are circular. They look like they could have been some sort of support structure for a type of roof or yep. whatever. And there's multiple of these things. It's a huge site. They've only uncovered a tiny fragment of the of the number of uh, stone circles. And now there's evidence that there's multiple other gigantic sites just like it 
in other hills nearby. Yeah, it's been dated to basically the end of the, the end of the Younger Dryas, so it's right at twelve thousand something years old. Yeah, that it was buried right intentionally, and so that again lends itself to okay. Pe- number one, they were making art, beautiful art, and megalithic architecture. Yeah, right at this time, right after this incredibly catastrophic period. And then it was intentionally buried. And so the idea is that that's when it was made, was when it was buried. Well, right. when, no. you know, <laughs> yeah, to no. me, I look at that like, no, no, no. This was something that survived yeah. the cataclysm in whatever form. Maybe it was just the pillars that survived and they were like, we need to bury this yeah. protect to protect it. it. Yep. And that's the reason why we still have it. That's it the had, only if reason. If it had not have been buried, it would not, it would have crumbled or it would have been quarried. Yeah, I hear that question a lot about about you know uh, antediluvian civilization or what you know. It's not so specific, but some ancient lost civilization. Well, why don't we find their artifacts? Everywhere? Yeah, we are. We have. <laughs> there yeah. are. Their artifacts are. Yeah, and the other possibility is that we have found a lot and it's been mislabeled. Right. That's right. This is the other question. Now that now this so one. Is, this is what we need to get into for yeah. sure. Yeah, the, 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 the concept that, this is the problem. If you imagine, you know, any place that, that, is, that, is, a, that is a habitation area, a place where people live, one of the things we've noticed just in walking around, you know, just in hiking around our area is that people live in the same spots. Yes. Right? So if you, you know, for example, with us, if we're looking for arrowheads, you can find a site and you're like, this is a campsite. And then you find out by, you can do this by digging. And plenty of archaeology has done this as well. You dig down and you find basically layers of occupation. And as you go down, the occupation is older and older. But people have been camping on that spot for 12,000 years in, yeah. in a lot of cases. So then you have, like, for example, the city of Jericho. And it's the same thing. It's been a city or an occupation area at least back to eight to 9,000 BC. Okay. So that means that the site is being reused by people. And if you're not careful, uh, you can, you can make a mistake in saying that the most recent ancient occupation are the people who built the site. And if you're not, you know, if you're not real careful to dig down and kind of go all the way down to the bottom of the occupation layer, and then really date those materials if you can uh, and determine what is the earliest occupation and what were they doing here. And that's the thing. Archaeology is full of this. Mm-hmm. And when you really dig into these sites and you start looking in, you know, to the, the papers, the, the first discoverers, you know, what they wrote, what kind of work they did, and then the next guy and the next guy and what types of methods they used – there's so many cases where if they didn't utterly destroy evidence in the early days of archaeology when they were tr- – when really they were it, – it wasn't archaeology. It wasn't a science, yeah, so to speak. It was more like uh, – um, what do they call it? What? Grave robbing? Yeah, grave robbing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which ultimately led to a, a badass science. Uh, <laughs> they destroy a lot of stuff that you're thinking, man. Yeah. If only yeah, we you're like, where did that material go that only, they dug out yeah. of that passageway? Yeah. It's just gone. Blowing stuff up with dynamite. Yeah. You know, it's just that anyway, when you dig into these sites, you 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 can start to realize that okay, there's a there's a narrative being created here. And it's not this is not conspiratorial necessarily. It could be in some cases, but that a narrative get becomes developed. People have theories, they push the theory, and you know, there's there's biases involved. And there's just a lot of questions. And, um, you know, you see it like I, I read a lot of science stories, uh, archaeology uh, stories and stuff. And, and it's, it's mentioned in there that there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of unknowns. But they're always they're, they've got their story. Yeah. And it's pretty well accepted. That's what we're taught in school. But when you when you really look deeply into these many of these sites, almost everyone there are so many questions that 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 are not answered and and so many lines of inquiry that don't make sense with the standard story yeah yeah and then and then the next thing about 
continuous occupation is that there's no reason to think that these more ancient peoples weren't doing the same thing, right? They're also interested in the people who lived bef there before That's them. Right. Yeah. They're also rediscovering ancient sites. There's, there's, there's quite clear evidence that this took place multiple times in Egypt because, you know, if, even if you're just looking at the standard model dynastic periods, that's a long... I mean, Egypt, the civilization of Egypt, of what we think of as ancient Egypt, lasted a long time, thousands of years. And they had multiple periods that were where the civilization seemed to fall apart and there'd be 100 years or 200 years and then another dynasty would arise after that and they'd kind of have to rebuild from the ashes and the crumbled remains of what was there before they're still recognizably egyptian ancient egyptian but they're doing the same thing sites are lost and then they're rediscovered and then they're plundered or they're or maybe it's not plundering they're pulling artifacts out and they're relearning about their ancient past stuff that they had forgotten you know so if you're looking at for example the, the ptolemaic period in egypt well egypt was already two thousand years old at that point at least you know, the ancient Egypt's, Egyptian civilization. So they have crumbling ruins around them in the deserts, and, and they're going out there and digging into them and finding stuff that they didn't know was there and pulling all the stuff out of it and looking at it. And so when we get in there in modern times, you have multiple, multiple periods of civilization where they have been, you know, they build the, the, the structure, then it, they lose it, it crumbles, there's an earthquake, it par partially falls apart, gets covered by the desert, gets rediscovered by a, a less ancient civilization, they dig it all out, they rebuild the place, they put their names on it, you know, this happens multiple times, and then we come along much later, and we're trying to decipher, well, th there's, a, there's a long chain of occupation here, and when it's a structure that's been rebuilt over and over and over again, it's difficult to know who the first person was that built it. And how long ago that was. Unless somehow the structure was completely lost and never rediscovered until we found it. And yeah. that's just very rare in a place that's been continuously occupied for the entirety of the Holocene. Pretty much. So, you know, the, the question about the pyramids, how old are they? Well... That what's interesting about the pyramids in Giza, at the very least, is that they don't have, they don't have like the kind of markings that you associate with Egyptian, with dynastic Egyptian structures. With they wrote all over their architecture, painted all over them, and the interior of these pyramids have no markings except for the Great Pyramid has one chamber that has some painted markings on it that they consider to be masons' marks. Uh, but there's questions about that. That's like, sketchy. Yeah. How old is the paint? There's some evidence that it has been dated dated, and no one is, but you can't find any, you know, like, did they take samples and date the paint to find out? Is it recent? Is it modern? How old is the paint? And there's no information on that. Why wouldn't they date the paint? Well, maybe they did and they found out that it's only a few hundred years old. And that doesn't, that, that means that it doesn't answer who built the pyramid because right now they use that, those marks in there to say, well, Khufu built this pyramid. Because one of them, one of the marks is supposedly his cartouche, his name. Nowhere else in the pyramid is it written that he built it. And there's not any, you know, there's not a lot, there's, there's no documents in Egypt of them building those pyramids. That's on another, there's a whole bunch of stuff like this. That's another uh, rabbit hole entrance. Yeah. <laughs> which is, there is not a single original burial that has ever been discovered in any pyramid in Egypt. Yeah, that's right. The mastabas have some, but these big pyramids, they don't. Not one. Yeah. So the idea that, that these are tombs is a hypothesis. Right. That's it. Yeah, it's the, the idea that it's a gigantic... And they do the same thing for Central American pyramids. Right. It's, this, it's the tombs. same deal. Yeah. They're all tombs, yet... No, no mummies, no original burial has ever yeah. been found in any of them. Yeah. And the, 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 there is evidence, especially with the Central and South American stuff, that these modern, or the, these structures that we see on them that we equivalent, you know, the, like the Mayan pyramids, they're built on much ancient, more ancient structures that were there previously. This is also the case in, in Egypt. How many times have these sites been built on? And when you have continuous occupation... How many times has the same site been built on top of by each successive civilization? And how do you track that down? It's very difficult. It becomes muddled. You know, I mean, we, 
like in modern times, you have urban exploration and they do this. You know, you go to a modern city. It may only be a couple hundred years old. It's got stuff underground that people haven't seen in a hundred years. Yeah. The pyramids in Mexico were covered in jungle, basically. Dirt. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they were they were excavated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're huge. Right. <laughs> it's like, that's mind-blowing in and of itself. You right. Know? They, there's, I think is the, the Pyramid of the Sun. I can't remember which one exactly, but when they were doing the excavations, they, they ended up like digging into the wall of the pyramid itself. Oh, so yeah. the, a lot of the original surface was destroyed. Yep. They were pulling huge sheets of mica yeah. out of these structures yeah, that's it. and selling it. Teotihuacan. Yeah. There's been liquid mercury found underneath these things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's so much stuff in there. You're like, what? What does this have to do with a tomb? Yeah. And yeah, so it's, it's I mean, the ancient aliens, like, especially like, you know, the, the TV show that this is like some weird like landing sites for UFOs or whatever. You know. I I I don't think that that's the case, but I don't and I don't think it's necessary to to bring in aliens to explain any of the building of these things, but you know, we follow the work of Chris Dunn. He's an engineer and looks into uh the basic idea that form follows function, right? As an engineer. Yeah. And in many cases there are high precision artifacts that can't be made by the human hand without machine assistance. Uh, it doesn't mean a computerized machine necessarily, uh, uh, but you, you have to have something that gives you the same arc or curve over and over again, exactly the same, which would mean mechanical yeah. devices to cut stone, um, you know the 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 inclusion of these very specific materials lends credence to the idea that they were functional in some way. Yeah. Whereas the standard model of archaeology looks at these structures, and almost every one is going to be a tomb or a temple. Right. Ceremonial in some it's fashion. Ceremonial. Yeah. This is all these people, all these ancient butt flappers were just <laughs> religious zealots, and they were building. Amazing architecture just because of some crazy beliefs that they had that don't that are just total BS. Yeah. Or because they were ruled by this king that they thought was a god or something. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. yeah. And so yeah. and and it's 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 sort of I don't know. To me, I see it as um it's insulting. Yeah. To to the ancient people, whoever they were who built this stuff. It's like it's yeah. it's a it's a weird form of like Hey, hey, check out this story that they all thought was true, and that's why they did all this crazy shit. Right. Yeah. And a lot of these structures are aligned astronomically, which is another interesting factor. And this is, you know, th this is more accepted today than it was when I first started looking into this. Um, but it's gradually more and more accepted that a lot of these, uh, these structures that they paid attention to astronomy and they aligned them in some way, um, that's also considered to be ceremonial. You know, but when you're, when you're, when you're doing very specific alignments, like when we went to, uh, we went to Mesa Verde and we were looking at, the the, some of the Pueblo culture there Yeah, and they aligned their, they had alignments to things that are very specific and strange, you know, like the, um, the, the, the moon wobble, what yeah. is it? The maximum and yeah, it's the uh, major and minor. Something, <laughs> lunar oscillation, something like that. I just had it on. <laughs> uh, the major lunar standstill, major and liner, minor lunar sa standstill. Stand still. That's right. The very tiny movement it's of the moon in the sky. Point six 18. year cycle or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and they also aligned one entire wall of uh, uh, to a supernova that took place, the Crab Nebula. Yeah, and the, they they witnessed this supernova. Yeah. Okay, so they're obviously observing the skies, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing, they're they're building their, and so it's like. I mean, it's just us. It's just people, just like us, looking at the universe, wondering how everything works, and studying it. Yeah. And working it out. Right. You know, they, they noticed that these two natural pillars that were left over from a gigantic flood at the end of the Ice Age on top of this mountain that had a gap between them, that, that from a certain vantage point, 
the moon rose between the, the full moon rose between those two pillars right at at moonrise right at its standstill yeah position which takes place every 18.6 years someone noticed that yeah or they predicted it based on previous observations right yeah right in in whatever case they carried stones up to the top of this mountain because the 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 stones that they needed were not available yeah at the top of the mountain and so they carried all these stones up there apparently without pack animals they carried gigantic logs up there yeah trees and the the trek to the top of this mountain is like <laughs> yeah steep and it's very narrow because it's falling off on both sides yep and so this was a major undertaking they were planting maize yeah, corn like these tiny little corns and stuff, yep. and and you know there, there's ex- extremely cold winters. Yeah, and yet they built this big structure they up there in the right structure. spot to watch the moon yeah. stand still between those two natural pillars. And uh, you know while we're at it, uh, remember that supernova we saw? Yeah, a couple let's years just align this, this whole this wall, wall aligned to that point thing. to that thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's like it was all religious, right? This was uh, you know it was part of their. Yeah, religious ceremonies or it's like no, yeah. I, I just I don't I don't think so. <laughs> right, I think we've that that word is not the proper word to describe uh, their reasoning behind. Right, it. it's it's like calling a modern astronomical observatory like a religious temple. It's yeah, like, exactly. oh, this is a religious right. They're worshiping the stars. No, yes. that's not what they're doing in that thing. But in a way, when you start looking into the vagaries of language, yeah. This is what you can easily arrive at. Right. Especially if you have, like we try to do this a lot where you imagine yourself in the future after a cataclysm and having lost all this modern technology that we have and what you're describing to your kids or your grandkids or your great grandkids. Yeah. Who who are now one or two or three generations removed from that civilization. So their dad or their grandfather grew up without that. And you you still remember it, yeah. So they would have no concept for understanding this type of thing, and you're trying to de- describe to them how we had these things that fly around. You can't say space; yeah. that doesn't mean anything to them. It was up there with the stars, and it and and it circles the you know the 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 land that we're on, <laughs> and it's it's we we could send. Like I have this tablet. It's it's yeah, it's about you know it kind of looks like that piece of slate you got there. And you could, you could write, or you know, you come up with something to say, and you can use that thing, and it sends it up there, and then it uh, comes back down somewhere else, <laughs> and that other person can get what you said. And to them, it's like this is magic, like the yeah, you know. So it's <laughs> yeah. Well, how did you send the message? Well, there are these invisible like. <laughs> Uh, Waves of energy, sim- it just signals that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you can't even use the you word can't energy. Them. Yeah, uh, you can't use. Yeah. Well, how do you describe this to somebody who doesn't have any of these concepts? And so you can ima- you can easily imagine how the stories that are being told by the people who survived the cataclysm and remember the civilization very quickly become generalized in such a way because our languages are dedicated to the worlds we live in. That's right. We we have so much in our language today that 30 years ago we didn't have because of the rise of the internet yeah. and and computer technology and that type of communication. You could if you went back 30 years and tried to describe to somebody what you were doing yesterday, it wouldn't make any sense to them. Yeah. That's right. You would have to then describe so much stuff just to give them the the basic concept or you just have to change the words to make it match the world that they lived in yeah and this is what it looks like so thousands of years down the line we receive this story that was received by somebody else that was received by somebody else and so on and so on and so on all the way back to the person who maybe originally told it yeah and it is you know this text is one of these words like that used to mean like print on paper Mm-hmm. But most the way people use it now, it means a message sent to me over my phone. Yeah. Right. It's still it's still words. But, you know, like somebody I remember the first time I heard the word texted. You know, I think the watcher was the first one who said that to me. He's like, "Ooh, I'm getting texted. <laughs> I was like, 
I had never heard that word turned into a verb before. <laughs> Texted it. <laughs> <laughs> Texting, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was not like, you know, handing somebody a piece of paper with a message written on it was not called texting. This, yeah, is, so, this is something that happened. This is a very recent ad- adaption, of, so, you know. Yeah, so you take these you take these translations of say the these, you know, like the the book of what is in the duat or whatever, the the yeah. book of the dead. Yeah. Where it's talking about you know, you go you go to the underworld and you do all the stuff and then you become a star or something, you know, you, yeah. there's all this weird stuff about going up into the heavens and becoming I mean just all of the stuff about going up into the heavens yeah is now considered all religious it's just belief systems yep but I mean if we were trying to describe that in the future like well yeah they they went up into the heavens yeah and there were these specific heroes that were picked out by the civilization <laughs> and they went up into the heavens and became a star that we could all see moving That's through the sky. Right. They became a star. That's right. The satellite. Yeah. Or the state. The space, space station. station. Yeah. And they went up in a giant chariot of fire. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so there is like. We call this quant stuff. Yes. That's right. That's our term. Uh, that was Tell gotten the story. From, yeah. It was gotten from an old science fiction called. Uh, the star is my destination. And the basic idea is that scientific terms can be, the, the original meaning can be lost, but pe- they, people can still use them in, in ritualistic settings. And uh, should I tell the whole concept here? Like, the, yeah, yeah, so give this there was a, okay, there was a scientific give some in, context. In, man. Yeah, in, in, the, in the science fiction story, there was a scientific expedition, a spaceship full of scientists who were going out to do some specific some specific experiment, you know, long-term experiment or whatever, but their they their ship crashed or they lost power or something and they ended up stuck on an asteroid with just the fragments of their ship and they couldn't get back. And they were stuck there with no way to 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 the rest of the civilization the ship was just lost. It just vanished without a trace. But they survived and they had kids and those kids had kids and multiple generations down the line you know people in the science fiction story encounter this group of people who are now multiple generations extended from these original ancestors who were scientists so the ship was full of scientific instruments and texts books and documents and that's what they have right so these people who are like the great 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 grandchildren of scientists, they don't know any science anymore. They've completely lost all their science, but they have all these texts and all these, you know, uh, all these instruments that don't work anymore. And they've built an entire religion based on these ancient texts that they've got. (laughs) Okay. And so they read these in this, in the science, it was kind of done in a comedic kind of way in the, in the science fiction story, but these people would read these scientific documents like religious texts and use them as prayers and stuff like that. And one of the ones that they would read over and over was, um, it was like a chemical formula or a, or a a method for doing some chemical, uh, procedure. And at the end, the last phrase on there was the abbreviation quant stuff, which stands for quantity sufficient, but they used the word quant, the, the phrase quant stuff to mean amen. That was the end of the prayer that they had read from the document. Right. (laughs) And they had all, so there were all these distortions of things that you would recognize when, when the characters in there are interacting with these people, you know, they, they, they had a marriage ceremony and they were like the whole, like something blue, something new, something, you know, whatever the whole, what is that you do with the marriage ceremony? I think we went through this before. It's like, I can't a, remember. you know, it's like you, you have something new and something true and something blue, whatever. Yeah. And they, but they did it as inoculations in that because they're, they're merging it in some weird way with, with, you know, with scientific procedures so the girl that he's being forced to marry, the character is being forced to marry this girl who's one of the descendants of these. She's got like these marks on her arm and she's like, I've been inoculated with something blue and something, you know, but it's actually uh, this weird. It's just a phrase of her being married. Something old, something new, something borrowed and something blue. Thank you, watcher. That's the phrase. Right. But they actually gave her shots with that stuff into her <laughs> arm and it's all infected. And he's like, oh, what is going on here? Right. It's like. <laughs> So yeah, we use the term quant stuff to mean uh, any ancient uh, practice or idea that has been that has been lost and yet and sort of given new meaning. 
Yeah. That is more mystical. Right. Yeah. They're continuing on some kind of practice that originally had its basis in science. But they've lost so much knowledge that they don't even remember science itself and have no way of 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 re of of understanding the things that they're doing in ritual at this point. That's right. So there are some things when you're you're reading through ancient texts or whatever and you see something, you're like, man, that looks like quant stuff medical information, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like the people who have, are writing the text down have no advanced medical knowledge, and yet it looks like they were being given instruction or are recalling instruction from either documents or being given that stuff from a person who does have advanced medical knowledge and is trying to explain in very simple terms to somebody who has a language that doesn't contain the scientific jargon necessary to explain the concept. So they're just like, look, this is what you have to do. You know, don't put any of the dead bodies near the water. Yeah. Right. And, and there's no explanation for why, you know, and the person writing the text down clearly doesn't know why they do it, but they do it because it's, it's, it's ritual. Right. And so you're, so the idea that you're ritualizing something that has a basis in science is you know, this is this is not a totally strange phenomenon. Like the idea of not eating pork is one of these. Like the yeah. idea, you know, the, trichinosis. The, right? Yeah, there's a. It can kill you if if the the proper precautions aren't taken. So the idea to put it into a religious setting so that people will just follow it without asking for a further explanation. You know, because they don't require one. Because it's like, well, God said, don't do this, so I'm not right. going to do it. Right? That's quant stuff, and it's. It's an interesting. It's a very useful. Yeah, it is because yeah. uh, it's it's it can be a difficult concept to describe as you just did. But right. once you have that in your mind, <laughs> you're looking at at these whatever you know rituals or you're reading ancient texts. You can see it, and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, quant yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I always give that explanation from the old sci-fi story, "The Stars My Destination." But one we came up with that gives once you, once you've heard that story, now you can sort of try to. Uh, um, imagine this happening in the future, right? So let's say our civilization falls and a couple of hundred years from now, there are, you know, many generations down the line, there are people that are kind of inhabiting the ruins of our civilization. Most of the ruins are completely gone or whatever, but there might be some old rusting, uh, you know, hulks of cars spread around. And so they might, get, you know, ritualistically all climb into the car and go through the motions of like, you have to buckle your belt and then they all act like they're going somewhere. They remember, they have this knowledge that like, oh yes, now we're, we turn the key and then we're going somewhere and they all, they all do it in their minds, right? It's a ritual, but that ritual is to somebody who knows what to look for is actually talking about something that used to actually physically take place with science as opposed to now these people are like, yes, we're, I, I can feel it moving, you know, we're, we're going somewhere different and it's all happening in their heads. Yeah. And then after that, they take the stone tablet outside to receive reception. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it's they like, can talk to each other. That's right. <laughs> so they can talk to their yeah. ancestors That's through right. the so sky. They can, and, That's right. <laughs> so they can call upon the Google. <laughs> <laughs> he of many numbers. That's right. The great God Google. <laughs> <laughs> The master of all knowledge and advertisements. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So not only is there very interesting numbers embedded in the ancient text, but uh, when you start looking at the Great Pyramid, yep. there are many very interesting numbers embedded in that structure. Yeah in so many ways that are basically the same. It's like pointing to many of the same types of things. Like there are processional numbers in that structure. Yeah. And, and uh, pi and phi. Yes. Transcendental and, numbers that are buried into, into the, the architecture of it. <clears throat> Possibly the speed of light, squaring yeah. the circle, all kinds of very interesting and strange and, uh, mathematical and geometric fundamental things, functions. Yes. yes, fundamental things. And also things about the size of the earth. It's That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So what I was going into is that it. Um, I know somewhere Randall has a really good uh, lecture online about this type of thing. I don't know which one, but it's getting into the yeah, number probably systems. probably on Geocosmic Rex. Yeah. yeah. 
getting into the number systems, measurement, uh, you know, using the the inch, the foot, the mile, and uh, how that correlates with the human body, how it correlates with the measurement of time and geometry, 360 degrees in a circle, dividing those into the minutes and seconds of degrees of arc or minutes and the second minute. And it's that is a whole nother type of um, system that is not tangible, but yeah. it is very old and we don't know its origin. Yeah. Okay. So right. this system of breaking the dividing the circle into 360 parts and then dividing each one of those parts into 60 parts and then dividing each one of those parts into 60 more parts. Yeah. Is a very interesting uh, system. It is the way we measure time in the same manner. And of course, uh, time is sort of, you know, we, the, the markers of the passage of time are the heavens. Yeah. The motions in the heavens. And of course, we're moving in circles around the sun. And so uh, it makes perfect sense. So let's divide the circle into a number that is uh, divisible by the most possible numbers we can imagine so we can evenly divide it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you once you do that and now you're now you're able to sort of divide the big the, the great circle that we move around the sun in. Well, then you can divide Earth's third motion, which is the axial wobble, possibly uh, into using those same numbers. And and then, you know, you develop a a system of of linear or spatial measurement utilizing the human body and the and the proportions of the human body which um also are you know by nature they they have things like phi and stuff embedded yeah. in into our bodies and so like the the development of the empirical measurement system and how it correlates to the time and space imperial imperial i'm sorry yeah, it's it hasn't it hasn't, it hasn't. Empirical is it probably how they came about. But <laughs> it hasn't it destroyed is. any other measurement systems <laughs> yet. Right. So I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, empirical is is uh, empirical as in like the, the the pursuit of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is so, yeah. So they empirically generated the imperial measurement system. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> That's another thing that happens on this podcast is uh, <laughs> say a lot of stupid stuff. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't stupid. It's was just yeah, wrong word. That's <laughs> um, so yeah. The the way that those those two systems, uh, geometry, the measurement of the Earth geometry, uh, the measurement of time, and and you know the um, how they all correlate and how they're you can apply these systems to some of these ancient structures yeah like the great pyramid and arrive at very interesting mathematical constants or so you know weird yeah, stuff like that that's right and it's like it 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 begs the question who came up with this system yeah because how it's old so is it? old yeah. that it's almost embedded in the measurement system itself the the measurement in this the measurement system itself implies knowledge of the cosmos in ways that we would not even I mean, the distance from Earth to the sun, the yeah. distance from Earth to the moon, and all of these other things yeah. that it is just like, okay. Knowledge of the difference in the sizes of the Earth, uh, the moon and the sun, and it's just, yeah. It's like. It's incredible. Seeing these ratios built into very, some of these structures. Very yeah. high degree of mathematical understanding to, to just come up with a system. Right. And Randall also points out these, you know, the etymology of the word temple. You have temple, tempo, temporal. Uh, you know, that the idea that it, so you have you're using sacred geometry, which is specifically uh, uh, geometric concepts, principles and numbers that are built into nature that you can you can discover by empirical study. That's right. Uh, and then the concept of uh, so those concepts which are you, you don't you don't have to have things moving around to see them like, you, you know, the, the, the size of the earth is a thing it's and it's geometric and the differences between the distance from here to here and there to there those are geometric things and then there's you know the, the geometry of various shapes that are the, like the platonic solids 
these shapes that are built into nature all over the place and they're fundamental. Those things are in temples, but then there's also alignments to vast astronomical cycles and small ones too, like the year or the, the rotation of the planet itself. So those things are, are comprised of both the geometry that's built into nature, the sacred geometry and time. Like you can't see the cycle without the passage of time. So that's the right. idea of a temple being a record of the geometries of nature and the passage of time. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and that completely changes your whole concept of temple itself, right? You're like, okay, now I can see why these temples, rather than being places where people were just running in there and worshiping things that don't exist Put based your on food stories. Next that to are, the God so it'll rot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Worshiping things that don't exist based on stories that aren't real. Instead, what they are are like studies in stone of the nature of the universe and the passage of time. And that's yeah. really where, and then you start to ask yourself, how old is this? Yeah. Where did this come from? Because yeah. like when you start to just taking the, the simple uh, act of dividing the circle into 360 parts degrees, yeah. right? That thing, if you, if you start with that number, then you end up as you're, as you're studying geometry, let's say you make your equilateral triangle, you make your square, you make your cube, you start to d develop these, these, um, the platonic solids yeah. and you start to measure the angles built into these platonic solids, you end up with processional numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Every single one of them right. is a processional number. Yeah. 2160, 4,300 or 43,200. Yeah. 25,920. Yep. You know? It, it's it's you get all these numbers and you know 108 yeah but if you didn't divide the circle into 360 parts you wouldn't get those numbers and yeah. those numbers are the number of years of the passage of uh, you know the how many times the earth goes around the sun before the axial wobble changes 30 degrees right yeah <laughs> yep and so it's like it, it, who I, did this math? I, who did this? <laughs> they already knew about precession. Yeah. When they came up with this number system and they decided to incorporate it right. into the number system to measure geometry, you know, for, for, the, for geometry. Yeah. But I mean, this, the name of that geometry itself implies yeah. that this is, you know, they're like, this is what this is all about. Right. So you pick the best numbers and then we end up, that's what we use. And it's been used as far back as we know. And yeah. And then there's the, you know, when you, I know we're probably getting up on time here, but like the idea of calendars, right? You can look at calendars and ancient people's like, it's familiar to a lot of people that the Mayans were, you know, masters of the calendar. Like they, it's, it, in some cases it looks like they're astronomical and their time their, their calendars itself were far more advanced than the evidence that we see of their civilization itself. It seems to like be, it's, it's a strange outlier. Like their calendar science was way more advanced than anything they needed for the rest of their yeah. civilization. And the narrative is just like, Oh, well they were just, you know, it was part of their religion and they were yeah. obsessed with the, yeah. You know, it's like that. But they had, they had, the concepts of time that they have built into their calendars, like these gigantic, enormous, spans of time that are completely Cycles. unnecessary for, you know, an agrarian, whatever, a, 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 an agricultural civilization that otherwise didn't have a whole lot of advancements. And then you have things like the, the, the Vedic texts and stuff like that, where they're showing you these tiny, tiny fragments of time where you're like, they don't need, who needs, you know, a, a division of time so small that no human can possibly. We do. Yeah. We need it for our high technology. That's right. Because we measure things in tiny, tiny fragments of time because of technology. So that's, that's the right. question is like, you see things like little nuggets like that where some knowledge is being passed down and it's clear now, you know, most anthropologists and archaeologists accept that the Mayans calendar is something they inherited from an older civilization. Yeah. That the, that, that those and then, and then when we go to Egypt, we see it in structures, certain in stone. artifacts yep. in stone. And then in places like, you know, down in South America, we see it also in stone that there are these little hints of high technology in deep antiquity that are the only 
fragments left of of either one or many civilizations that are far older than anything we consider that, that you know that, that that's in the standard model of archaeology today. Gobekli Tepe is the only solid uh, known thing now that that's that's that old that shows this kind of you know this kind of this kind of megalithic building or whatever. Now I don't know how precise the site of Gobekli Tepe is in terms of honestly, it well, looks hand done. I mean, yeah, that's it what does. Kind of the way it looks. <clears throat> it does. So are there other types of precision built in? I don't know. People have. I mean, it's you know, it's it's relatively new. People are questioning like, is it astronomically aligned? What do these symbols mean? Are they are they are they constellations? Were they measuring the passage of time somehow with these circles? It's not clear, but it's still, it's things like this. And then also ancient maps where they had the longitude right. Longitude is a very difficult thing to do. We only got it right in the late 1800s, you know, yep. and, and to be a very able to, easy thing to do when you have machines. Right. Once can, you've got a proper timepiece that you can take onto a ship, a watch basically. And, and machining yeah. is a very useful tool when you need to make a very accurate timepiece. Right. So why are there ancient maps with very precise longitude markers of place? You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. So there are these little nuggets that point to the possibility. And then, you know, if you, another thing to look at is Hamlet's mill, this concept of the lo- of this, of this millstone that is in, is in all these ancient stories, something's spinning, turning very slowly, uh, and the stories are so ancient that they can't even be traced. They just, the authors put it as they, they disappear into the mists of antiquity, the stories themselves do. And they all have this imagery of this gigantic, slowly, very slowly turning stone, which is probably talking about the procession of the equinoxes, which takes 25,920 years to complete. A very slow turning circle. Yep. So that's Hamlet's mill, you know, the, 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 this, the millstone of the gods grinds very fine and slowly, right? It's just, it's yeah. like, it takes forever to, for it to do it. And yet it seems like ancient people in very distant times were already aware of these gigantic cycles and numbers, like Kyle was saying, when they seem to pop into being out of nowhere and start building giant civilizations four th- in 4,000 BC. Yep. So that's what we look at on this podcast. And, you know, a lot of it is speculation. We... <clears throat> we throw out crazy ideas and laugh them off and shoot them down almost yeah. immediately. Send us your ideas. We'll shoot them down. That's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so there you go. I don't know if that was any more helpful than the last time we did this, but it sure was fun. <laughs> the old rabbit hole, rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've come to decide that there's only one rabbit hole because yeah. all rabbit holes you decide to go down into seem to connect to each other, yep. which means there's only one rabbit hole, which means that one rabbit has been really busy. Incredibly busy one rabbit, because <laughs> all these rabbit holes are connected somehow. Yep. And yeah, so that, that is, that didn't even, we didn't even touch on the modern... We didn't even scratch the surface of the rabbit hole, honestly. Yeah, I mean, there's UFOs, missing people, other I know, other I, I was pretty sure I was going to be going all UFO and, and <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, on on this uh, rabbit hole, rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, what it comes down to is you don't need, a- need aliens to have built these ancient structures. We're more interested in a much more ancient, advanced human civilization. Definitely interested in that, but also interested in the in the possibility of aliens and whether yeah. we are being visited and whether we have in the past. I mean, it's all it's all interesting stuff. Is it necessary to explain the ancient monuments that we have? No, no. Nope. Uh, but are we? Do we have un, unexplained phenomena in our skies? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was so? going to say something else. Uh, damn. <laughs> Just lost it with the old aliens thing. <laughs> oh oh yeah. Okay. The concept of these eyes, we talk about this too, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and you should check out the the glossary of terms on the website. Yep, um, these eyes are basically after you know just continuing to go down the path of digging in the into various rabbit holes. You learn some, you, you get some tidbit of information, right? You're like, ah, oh, oh. you make a connection, and then you find out later. When you're looking back at something you already looked into, you realize that new piece of information you discovered uh, weeks ago or whatever connects it, it and it provides yeah. another possible 
solution. Yeah, opens new doorways. It and opens possibilities. new doorways of inquiry. It op- yeah, yeah, in to, stuff you'd already gone through and looked at and spent tons of time digging into. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's it's, and that's another reason why this is always a continuing conversation. It's yeah. It doesn't matter. We did it. We did episodes on on subjects years ago, and we could do them again, and we'd have a different take because you you, you know constantly learning and seeing things in new ways. So that's right. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. That yeah, was a lot of fun. fun. So you can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com and check out the website, brothers of the serpent.com. Kyle just mentioned it. It has lots of stuff there, all the podcast related stuff, including the encyclopedia and the glossary. Uh, also the snake skins, which is our merchandise store. So if you guys want to support the show that way, you can get t-shirts and other cool swag. There's also the pyramid scheme, which is our, which is uh, how you can support the show monetarily. So if you like the show and <clears throat> you feel like it gives you some value, then you can give us some value back however much you want. Uh, there's Patreon. There's also a, a PayPal donate button there for one-time donations. If you join the Patreon, we do have Patreon content. So uh, we have just recently started adding stuff, and that's been fun. So, yeah, if you yeah. join the Patreon, you get your you get a special Patreon feed. Um but you got the- yeah, I was just going to say that uh, if you do a one-time donation to the PayPal in the amount of $50 or more, we give you uh, producer credit oh, yeah. for the show. That's right. That's right. And uh, so, yeah, give us reviews wherever you can. And thanks for the reviews that have been coming in. I was seeing that. You know, and t- I will read your name in full unless you tell me not to. Give me an alias so yeah. I can read something. Or say anonymous. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, I've been seeing the review. I, p- I could tell people listening to the back catalog because they're like, too much laughing, five stars. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we're on Twitter, so follow us there at Snake Bros with No Vowels, S N K B R S. There's a Facebook group if you want to join that. There's also a Discord chat. So on the website, there's a connect button to the Discord. Lots of, uh, lots of other Snake Bros, the Snake Force is in there, and you can talk to them. People are always having great conversations in there about all these mysteries and more, way more than we could ever possibly talk about on the show. Uh, so join the Discord if you want to talk to like-minded people about these kinds of things. No politics. Yeah, no politics, no porn. Be nice in the chats. Right. <laughs> uh, there's also or I'll give you the boot. <laughs> That's right. Kyle will kick you out. He has zero. He's no mercy. Uh, we also have the Library of the Serpent, uh, so that's that's run by Jeff. He's constantly updating it, adding things to it. That's lots of lots of uh, documents and other things that are in the public uh, public domain, and then also links to buy books that we are, that talk we talk about on the show and or relate to topics that we talk about on the show. And uh, yeah, thanks to History Shift, he makes all of our YouTube videos. Uh, so thanks so much to him, and uh, yeah, all of you listeners out there, we love you guys. Always have, always will. I've never banned anybody from the Discord. <laughs> Just kicked them out. So That's right. <laughs> come back with a with a new attitude. Love you. Yeah. Always have, always will. <laughs> Good night, Adamu. Turn it up, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs>